because we got ducted twice, we then started to get a bit scared about engines. So you hear the puck, 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 puck of an engine going, and then you just realise that your heart rate is beginning to match that beat of the engine. One guy just kind of did that. He knew what he was doing. He wanted to rob us and kill us. He whipped a pistol out, and before he could do anything, Ian, with his paddle in his hand, basically. So we shot you underwater. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Been shot once, you're underwater, you can't see anything. You're shot again. Natural instinct is pull away. And you did the opposite. John, Ian, welcome. Welcome to the t &E office. Thank you for making the effort to come and join. I only heard about your the expedition and essentially what you guys are doing recently when those posts started popping up. So I'm really excited about this to dig into because I really I know the bare bones of the story and that's it. So let's just get straight into it. It would be great to hear who you are, who is John, who is Ian, just a, an introduction to yourselves and then we will kick into the story. Yeah. Well, cheers mate for having us for a start. It's good to be down here. Um, I'm John, uh, former bootneck. I was leading uh, Amazon Summit to Sea expedition earlier this year. Um, and yeah, from Scotland, 35 years old. I suppose I can do that again if you want. That's a classic. <laughs> that is a classic bootneck answer. Yeah. I'm just like, right, this is who I am. This is what I've done. Yeah. Next. <laughs> Say as little as possible. So you grew, you grew, where did you grow up in Scotland? Uh, so yeah, I grew up in Edinburgh, born and raised in Edinburgh. Um, my dad was a climber. He took me all around the sort of yeah, Western Highlands, doing a bit of climbing and, and walking and camping as a young kid. Um, and went to school down there and um, sort of left, came out of school and didn't have a plan. Did a few odd jobs, went traveling for a year, had a good, a year just piss, pissing up around the world, which was great. Um, but it was kind of, there was no direction. Came back, did a few more odd jobs. And then I think by the time I was 24, I just had enough and decided to join in the core. Like you said, that sort of 99% need not apply um, motto really, stuck with me and I wanted to go and properly challenge myself. So went down to Limston and the rest is history, really. Mm -hmm. meeting, meeting the boys. Join the elite. Yeah. <laughs> Ian, what's your fill us in? Not yeah, so I joined Johnny on the, uh, he basically emailed me and said, do you want to come to the Amazon? I said, yes, that sounds like good fun. So I went along with it. Um, I'm from Dartmoor, mostly. Um, Fogging tour, no, not quite Fogging tour, but... Uh, just East Dartmoor, uh, and had family members join the Marines, and then went to my brother's passing out parade and saw him. Thought I was too much of a sort of chubby rugby player to be able to join the Marines, but found some cross country in me, and then joined um, and left in 2020. So when did did you? So you, what year did you join, John? I joined 2013 and left in 21. It might have been 22, <laughs> to be honest. I think it was 21. Yeah. And you, when did you join yeah, in? Joined in 2009 and left in 2020. So we may have crossed because I I joined in, no, we wouldn't. I joined 2008. So I passed out in December 2008. So we were there, like, uh, you were there okay. just, just afterwards. But I'm always interested whenever I chat to ex Marines, ex Bootnecks, what was your, and I'll let each of you do it, what, what was your experience? Of training because you went in i was the same i was 24 so i was a little bit older but how did you find limpston uh, to be quite honest and this is a travesty for i guess how my career went is training was probably my favorite part of my entire career in the core like the amount you get done every day the amount you learn about yourself like you're getting thrashed aren't you for for full days and and when you're on exercises like days and days on end so that was an eye-opener about how what the human body is capable of and then my career itself was a lot of on base and phasers and, and uh, there was nothing going on between 2013 and 21 or up until now, as you know. Um, and I didn't go down the SF route. Um, I went I went as an LC. So in general, like my career was still good. I had a lot of good times and I met a lot of really good blokes, but probably training was actually the most um, eventful part of it, if I'm honest. Apart from the, the brief, brief time we had out in the Indian Ocean, which was a brilliant draft as well. Right, that's yeah that's we chatted about this briefly before we came on it's <clears throat> i think and i'll let you i'll ask you how you found it because you you joined the marines and you passed out and you just missed 
I guess it was the tail end of Afghan. Afghan was essentially finishing. We were pulling yeah. out. And it, you are then surrounded by a lot of guys who have been in Afghan and you sort of missed that. You've very just missed it in the same way when the Falklands happened and then guys joining it, same same with Iraq. How did you find how did you find that? How was that experience? I, I had a huge amount of respect for the corporals in my training training trip. Uh, a lot. I think three of them went and got badged pretty soon after leaving us. Um and they were brutal and fair and brutal. So I think that's probably why I enjoyed training so much because I was really getting a lot out of these guys. Um and then go yeah, go, I suppose as you progress through your career, a lot of these guys leave and and um I don't wanna I think we should probably cut this bit out, I don't wanna downtrodden on the core at all. But yeah, as as you progress through there's less of these lads in in, in that situation and maybe it's um for me it was kind of a reason to leave, I guess. Um the challenge wasn't quite there. I think yeah. it, I think it's hard when you join something, you know, we liken it to becoming a firefighter and then never actually fighting a fire. And it's yeah, it's it's two sides of the coin because it's careful what you wish for. And for for the reality for most guys is once you've been and done a tour, y- you realize the reality of, of war and actually what it's like. But that doesn't change when you haven't done that. People can say all they want about that stuff, but you still, you've joined an organization. You still want to experience it for you, yourself. You want to do it and you feel unfulfilled if you haven't done it. And you feel like, I suppose every bloke wants to test themselves ultimately. And yeah, it may not end well if, if you do that. But if you haven't tried it, you feel like you, you, um, you're missing out on something. And that's definitely how I felt. And to be fair, it was some of my own decisions in, in the core. You know, can't can't blame the core for that. I I could have gone down the SF route. I could have given that a go, and I didn't. So um, yeah, I, th- I suppose by the time I got to my career ending couple of years, um, I looked back in hindsight, and I wish I'd done things differently. Um, but it was time to leave at that point, and uh, it was time to move on for like different challenges and uh, challenges that I could create um, without having my hands tied, so to speak, with with um, getting leave and things like that. Yeah. It's, mm. uh, I think the regret, it's something I hear a lot with clients that I work with. And you hear it as well with people who left the military who perhaps didn't do things that they want to. I think the thing with it is whenever, and we all fall into the trap, whenever we look back at paths not taken, we always imagine the best version of that path. So you did do an Afghan and you had all these great experiences where you did go to special forces and had these experiences. What we never do is, you could have come out of training, got drafted to unit, gone to Afghan, and within two days stepped on an ID mm-hmm. and either lost mm-hmm. all your limbs or died. We never imagined that route. And it's easy to slip into it, the paths that we don't take. But if we dwell there, it just it, it's just a negative. We can't change that. Yeah. But what I love is exactly as you said, so, okay, that didn't happen. What I can do is leave and I can take control of that and create my own challenge, which you will get onto, which you certainly did. And you probably, ironically, through the expedition to the Amazon, ended up getting in a gunfight, which out, outweighs a lot of what guys would have done in Afghan. So it's all come full circle, but we'll we'll save that for a little while. Ian, what was your, how was your experience in training? Training, I feel like I had a lucky, I had a very good kind of training team. They were good they were yeah hard but fair um but then i have other experiences of you know family members or friends i just had some absolute brutal bloke who's just sadistic and just wanted to kill them um but actually yeah i quite enjoyed training as much as you kind of can you, yeah, as johnny was saying you learn loads about yourself and then after that as you're talking about the kind of you unlucky when you're younger because you just want to go and prove yourself test yourself and battle and all of that but then as you get older, you think actually probably pretty lucky not to come back and, you know, lose limbs or have those horrible experiences where you're just looking for mines in the road. And, you know, so it's, it is a real, yeah, it's kind of a catch 22, isn't it? In, in a way. Yeah, absolutely is. The, the, one of the things that one of the lads said to me as we were chatting about, as I was leaving, I was still down at pool and leaving. And you kind of talk about, you know, like looking for that one big job and, mm. 
he actually said, he said, you know, everyone wants to go and have a scrap until someone gets shot in the face. <laughs> and then it kind of hits home and it's not so fun anymore. So mm. it's, it's two sides of the coin. What, just while we're still on training, before we move on, heart, either the, or two things, the hardest commando test for you, which one you found the hardest and the hardest point overall, or what you found the most testing through training, if you had to pick one thing. Um, endurance course was the hardest for me by a long way. Tarzan was great fun. Uh, 30 miler, I was like ready by then. And it was, it felt all right. And the nine miler, everybody breezes that, don't they? The six miler for some reason is hard and then the nine's okay. But the endurance for me was absolutely honking. Like I was coming in at like 71 minutes, I think something like that. So I was just scraping through is that. Is it 72 time. minutes you get? I can't think. remember. Something like that. Might be, yeah. yeah. I remember being like a couple under, like, and just, you know, just about get, <laughs> getting there. So that, that one was bad. For some reason, I kept picking the wrong tunnels and getting my webbing caught and all the stones had been dragged up. And Well, or my cardio was probably just pretty shit as well. <laughs> but um, I, I got back tripped, which was my hardest, the hardest point of the core, I think. I loved my original trip. Uh, made a lot of good good brothers in there. And I got back tripped for, a, had blood poisoning in my, arm from my hand up to here and I ended up two weeks in hospital and because of that missed out on bottom field pass out and then had to go back um, and I just never settled back into the next trip um, yeah lots just lots of reasons for that it was it was horrible uh, I was in tears in the grot like leaving leaving that that trip and um, but I guess it builds your character as well stuff like that happening but it was definitely the most difficult part of it for me that that is just for anyone who doesn't so back trooping is essentially you so everyone you start with your original troop troop of guys and then if you get injured or fail an exercise or something happens you can get back troops to you essentially go into what they call hunter troop where you do rehab and rehabilitation and then you join another troop that's going through so you leave a group of guys that you formed a really strong bond with since day one and then you get thrown into another group who already have that strong bond together and suddenly you're the new bloke. And that's why every, everyone wants to pass out as an original, but blood poisoning, things happen. Like you, say, yeah. you, know, you can't control that. And I, I get it. I can imagine how shit that would feel and mm -hmm. trying to fit in, suddenly reintegrate with that and pass out. Yeah. You basically go from, a, you know, you're all in that, initial group you're all troop legends and you all love each other and you go from that to being a grey man and just trying to get through the through the last stages so when I talked about my love of training it was all from the first half or the first two thirds the last third was just get get this done like yeah it, but it is like you said the obstacle is the way it builds through that you you learn so much about yourself and it's interesting that that's all that hardship and training but for you learning to reintegrate with a that group or that a, a group of people that you haven't had that bonding with was that adversity, the hardest part, which is it's human nature, isn't it? The tribe we want to be part of, we want to be part of the tribe and that, that brotherhood. Mm -hmm. What's, uh, what's your hardest commando test and <clears throat> hardest point of training? Yeah, I was definitely more of a gorilla. So I preferred the, uh, assault course for sure. But I can't really, it's such a small part of your career that I can't, Specifically, I remember just hanging out on the endurance endurance test. Then the 30 mile, I remember doing a point where I was just swaying. I think it was like the 28 mile point. And everyone, including the corporal leading us, was hanging out. <laughs> we were just wobbling all over the kind of the final final ascent almost. Um, but yeah, I think it's just the longevity of boonek training. Yeah, at some point it catches you out and you just, you know, want to go back to loved ones. And then you, the weather's howling against those horrible grots on the estuary and you're just there going, oh, I've got to go in the field tomorrow. And, you know, you're just um, mentally hanging out and then you go and do it and it's fine and you get through it. But it's it's all of those kind of little tests of character that kind of, yeah, thickens your skin. Yeah, that is that is definitely what got for me. Just when I look back at the hardest point, it's that wake at the alarm going off at 5 a.m. and those first few moments where you reorientate and you're like just ground it because it's eight months and I think that it's for 24 hours a day, you're always a couple of minutes away from hearing those immortal words and fucking stand by it, lads. Yeah. Get, mm -hmm. get, on the, mm -hmm. get on the landing, everyone on the landing. 
and you know someone's fucked up and you're going to get thrashed for something. Mm-hmm. And just that in the morning, 5 a.m., staring at your tired face, white, pale face in the mirror when everyone's there, like no one's talking, everyone's <laughs> shaving for the day. And you're like, I've got another six months of this. That for, that for me was the hardest, that Groundhog Day, like I said, the longevity of it, just day after day. But yeah. you do, you get through it mm-hmm. and zoning, just concentrating on what you have to do in the moment was the thing that helped me. So how did, um, how did, so you went through training at different points. Where did you, I assume you met where you were still serving in the core. Mm-hmm. When, how did that happen? When did you meet? We met in Diego Garcia. It was a bit of a- Hate the dream draft. Yeah, Diego it was a dream Garcia. draft. Um, we met there. I, was, I knew I was at the, towards the end of my sort of bootneck career. Um, I'd gone for selection a couple of times and, and failed. And then I was looking at going again, but the classic kind of Marine thing of they put you on a ship for seven months, so you can't really train properly. And, and I was looking at all, dis- all sorts of different things. I think I was more just trying to stroke my ego more than anything, looking at, you know, I, was like, oh, I could go to Sandhurst or I could become an Apache pilot or, because I think my body was kind of done then. I was getting back and ankle problems. And I thought if I try the hills again, I might just snap in two. Um, but then I just had a kind of word of my ego. Um, actually went into the Sergeant Major to go, I want to leave. And uh, but he said, ah, oh, Corporal Roberts, good to see you. He goes, I've got you that draft to Diego Garcia. And he's like, what did you want to come and see me about? And I was like, oh, nothing. No. <laughs> I'll take that draft. And uh, and then met, met Johnny and we met two other mates. Um, one of them was the Marines, one of them was a Matlo engineer. And the four of us just instantly kind of bonded and we had a mm. right old laugh. You're going to have to explain because no one understands. So Sorry, yes. Yeah, so Diego Garcia be- is the dream draft <clears throat> in the Marines. So you're going to have to explain. So just to put it into context, drafts you can get in the Marines are... Baz Lane, where John was, uh, that's up in Scotland on the nuclear base. Shit weather. Like, just a, sh- a pretty shit draft, generally, for yeah. most people. You can get pinged to be a cook, a driver. Basically, there are a lot of shit drafts in the Marines, but there is one golden, <laughs> golden ticket, yeah. and that's Diego Garcia. So I'm going to let you explain what, Di- what the Diego Garcia draft is. How do we sum this up? You're basically on holiday for a year on tropical beaches, and there is a really good part of the Marines job out there. I think it's about 20 bootnecks. But you go off and the, it's the Chagos Archipelago, which is about 500,000 square miles of, of ocean and, and little um, paradise kind of islands. And um, you go around them just to kind of do patrols to stop, stop illegal fishing and any kind of piracy. But mostly you're just snorkeling and kind of, you, you're getting that footprint on the island, of course. Like you're doing your job. There's a lot of uh, there's yeah, a lot, a lot of lot chilling out, a lot, a lot of downtime. Time. Yeah, but the job itself, like on the outer island patrols, you you're going into big swell. Like as LCs, we we were get we had a really good job, like bringing you know people of all different uh, abilities in and out of these really difficult to reach beaches with huge swell and stuff. So it was a really cool part of the job. That um, you definitely learn a lot. Of, I learned a lot of new skills mm, out there. Um, but then there was so much downtime and actually too much downtime. And you end up it's getting a bit, getting at, a bit the club a bit too, too many. Because it's a massive, week. it's yeah. a massive American base, isn't it? Out yes. there. Yeah. So you've got the, all, yeah. which are, for anyone, you know, even without an Afghan, if, if you were going to go to when you're on Kandahar or Bastion, making the effort to walk the extra 20 minutes to the American galley, scoff house, scran house, whatever you want to call it, was worth it because the food basically. The Americans have got all the cash and all the resources. Back, so anything yeah. mm-hmm. like using the helicopter assets, the food, the rest of it. So when you say an American base, it probably doesn't mean much. But basically, what that means is really good food, yacht clubs. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. it's just they just get. It's almost like a holiday. It's like being in the RAF. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. yeah. yeah. <laughs> but just clarify as well because you get LCs. It's landing. Just give a brief description of what an LC. So in the Marines, just very broadly. Every job is done by a Marine, so cook, driver, soldier, all the way through, and LCs is, I'm going to let you explain what LCs are. So other bootnecks would say that we're the taxi drivers of the sea, but <laughs> it's probably slightly true. But um, yeah, basically we we drive a lot of different craft in and out, uh, an amphibious role from ship to land, um, and, you know, drop off uh, other lads. Um that's, I mean, I guess that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. Uh, beach and drills, um, anything from a, a Zodiac size up to a, a big uh, LCU, which can carry, you know, big vehicles. Yeah. Um, 
generally speaking, the smaller the craft, the more interesting the job. Yeah. If you're yeah, on definitely. Zodiacs, you tend to be more of a reconnaissance role, which is good fun, small teams, beaches at night, all of that sort of thing. Then the orcs, which are quite good as gunboats, they can fly around and get to shoot 50 cows off them into, into beaches, which is great fun. And then as you start progressing up, you kind of get the more kind of D-Day looking skips, which are called LCVPs. And then the even bigger type of skips, which are the LCUs, which not as good to work on. So it's a, yeah, it's a bit of a, what's, what's the word for the job? It's kind of a 50-50, I suppose, a bit of a Marmite job. You can, some, of the, some of the work you can love and other other parts of it is, yeah, just dire. It's like the entire <laughs> military, almost boot next career is, yeah. get some great stuff, but you get some yeah. really mm. shit stuff. But only ever, on the outside, everyone always sees flying around in the gunboats or jumping yeah. out helicopters. It's the cool stuff. I just, will say that about Faz Lane, like it's all small boats. So that part of the job is interesting, despite the sort of being on a Navy base and all that. In know, Scotland. Yeah. 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 And that is the <laughs> rainiest part of Scotland. Like, just um, just before we move on from the Diego Garcia and that journey forwards, I just, just wanted to dig in a little bit because it was really interesting what you said around recognising that ego piece and mm. driving towards. So how, so you went on, you went for selection for Special Forces a couple of times. And so I guess what happened there, but the more interesting part of when you realised, when you really questioned yourself as to why you were doing that and then how that then changed your thinking and actions? Yeah, I think it was the, I'd worked so hard to kind of get in, you know, just even just to get on a briefing course. It is hard in, in the Marines because there's a small amount of manpower and you have to work extremely hard and show you're willing to be able to actually apply for SF. And most, not all, but most hierarchies need their manpower in place so to let you go to attempt something like sf is actually it's not what they want so you're kind of up against it before you even you know sign the papers to 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 go along and i had basically failed a briefing course i think it was in 2012 or 2013 that sort of time maybe yeah um and then come back and gone for it again with a friend um really good friend of mine who we were, we were going for briefing course together but then I got told by the landing craft side you can't go on that and he went straight through and badged and I was kind of held behind and felt really fit and basically frustrated then went on through to the hills and it's you know luck of the draw but ultimately I wasn't probably just wasn't fit enough but it's just kind of I had a couple of bad marches and I failed with some really like legends so I was kind of happy with that I looked around went actually if I'm gonna fail it was with these blokes so and a couple of those guys that when we got when we got sent off um, sent away from Brecon that they actually still friends now really close mates um and it's that you're just constantly pushing it feels like you've got not only the uphill struggle of pushing against the marines but you're also just those demons within yourself to try and feel like you're good enough to you know to, there's always that you always want more chevrons on your shoulder or you always want those dits you want to go to war you want to you know, there's, and even guys who I know who have, have badged, they're still always looking up to try and do the next next thing. And it's, they sometimes don't stop just to sit and chill and be at peace with who they are. And I had that, I was on ship for seven months in the Arabian Gulf um, after I'd failed. And I thought this is just, you know, a horrible thing for my hierarchy to kind of do to me because I was supposed to go back on a, a winter hills. And they had, um, yeah, basically said, go, go, go and do seven months on the Arabian Gulf, which, um, you know, it's it's Marines and Navy get on quite well, but not not that well. So it's a bit difficult being on ship while other lads were going through and being able to badge. And that's when I thought, well, actually, I might go back and my back might give in. And as at that point, my body was kind of getting very sore. I was getting getting a few problems. Um, and then I was like, okay, what, what can I do next? What's the next thing? You know, what, how, how do I prove to myself that I'm good enough? And then I was sort of questioned, well, you know, who, who am I asking if I'm good enough? That, that can only come from me to feel good enough rather than having to prove to everyone else, you know. And uh, it got to that point where I had to just have a chat with my ego and go, right, enough of this, because it doesn't matter if I'm, you know, I was, like if I go into 
paras and become an officer and I'm a you know troop commander of the paras or if you know if I've managed to get through that or if I'm flying Apaches around am I still going to feel whole if I've done that and the answer is probably not so then I kind of had that word myself when actually I need to knock this on the head and be content with sort of who I am as a bloke and that's yeah that's basically that. Hey, that thank you for sharing that because that is what you've described there to me is something that I think it's a universal struggle. It's something I hear all the time from the people I coach. And these are all, you know, some of them seven figure business owners, you know, successful CEOs on paper, everything is great, but there's still that discontent and needing to prove yourself. And I think you took making that decision there is the harder decision. Actually, the easier one would have been just to go and try and push back through and follow something that was being directed from your ego and not your honest self. Mm -hmm. The hardest, when people come in to the coaching that I do, the very first thing I say is this will never work unless you are willing to have an honest conversation, honest conversation with yourself. If you're, if you're not able or you're not at a point where you're willing to hold the mirror up and really look inside and have those conversations, this will never work. And that is, you're completely right. Most people go through life and they, they never stop. They don't really stop and ask themselves, who am I? What, yeah. what, what do I value? How do I want my life to look? And make decisions and choose a path from that as opposed to that ego driven, that need to find something, whatever that is. So the fact that you did that yourself, had that time of reflection came to that, says a huge amount about your character. Um, so yeah, it's a real, a real testament because it's, it's such a huge struggle for mm -hmm. people. Um, so Diego Garcia, you guys met there. What was the, how did, how much longer did you both serve? And then how did you come to, where, where did the idea come from for Summit to See? And we'll go into hold because I don't know a huge amount about, about it. And I know a lot of people listening won't. So how did you get from Diego Garcia meeting each other to deciding to do Summit to See? Um, so we, we had six months together in DG probably. Mm -hmm. uh, Ian left first and uh, I guess you had like a year left, six months left in the core. Yeah. And, yeah, were, yeah. and I had another six months in DG and then um, another two year and a half, two years in the core, I guess. Um, and when I put my shit in, um, for whatever reasons as well, I was I was going through a bit of a shit time, I guess, mentally. Just and it was probably is to do with not having that word with myself and and feeling like I hadn't proved myself. Um, but fortunately, um, my dad is a is a bit of a legend. Um, he did a lot of expeditions back in the day and climbing, and he he'd also thought of a few expeditions that he hadn't got he'd been able to do. And um, when I was, you know, in that year when you when you're leaving, he came to me with this idea, and it and it changed my like um, thinking about everything. Basically, I was obsessed with with planning this exped from, from that point on onwards. And the and the expedition idea was to go down the Amazon from its highest source, which is a, a volcano in in a Ecuador called Chimborazo. And if you look at the the geography of the planet, it's slightly squashed at the poles and and a pushes out at the equator and Chimborazo is right on the equator. So the, the summit of Chimborazo, if you draw a straight line to the center of the earth, is the furthest sticking out point on Earth's surface or the closest place on Earth to the sun. Um, and that is a source of the greatest river. The Amazon puts more fresh water into the oceans than the next seven largest rivers combined. So the highest point is, is a source of by far the greatest river. And that captivated me instantly and started mapping that um, and I think maybe a couple of months after I'd left the core, I had the plan and I had I knew it was possible and I'd had mapped it all. And uh, the next thing was to look for a team. And Ian was the first man that I sent an email to. Um, you know, we'd, we'd had that bond um, over there. We'd worked really well together. We were, we were good friends. We we're relatively new friends. Like mm. we didn't know each other all that well, but we knew we worked well together. And also, I knew he was a robust bloke, and that's the kind of thing that I thought. As much as you need a mate with you, you need a robust lad, and uh, he was, he was, he was also in a position where he could take six months out of his out of his life, and thankfully he came back with a yes, <laughs> straight away. So, 
that yeah. you have kind of covered it, but that that does intrigue me. The fact you were relatively new friends, and out of all, all you know, served in the core, you've met a huge amount of you know, resilient guys because you've been through training. Mm-hmm. But you chose, you chose Ian. Yeah, I mean, I I I was very recently split up with somebody, and uh, just after you'd left, uh, I don't know how much you want to talk about this. Had had been in the same situation. He'd, he'd uh, had a breakup. And that was probably in my head as well. Like I was kind of going through it. Uh, pretty, I was I was in a pretty bad place to be fair. It was probably a combination of a, of a lot of things, um, and that you know that kind of thought was was there as well. So that was another reason uh, to, to give you a shout as well. There was yeah, there was lo- lots and lots of reasons why you and you got man for the job, I guess. There's lots and lots of blokes who are completely would be great. Loads of guys who would stick their hands up and and love to go out there, but. A lot of guys have got relationships, families, and jobs, so they've got to hold down. So it's just not even a, you know, I can probably think of a good 20 guys that would be absolutely brilliant in place or, or with us. But they're just, there's no, there's almost no point in even asking because they, you know, you probably put pressure on their relationship. <laughs> they, would, they would come along and then probably have a breakup and, you know, so you, yeah, yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it's, you, it's not necessarily a, a classic saying of like a single man's game, but, you need to be pretty um, free to kind of do it. You, you know? need to be self-employed as well, which we both yeah. were. There was there was loads of reasons, like it was the just the jigsaw puzzle that that, that fitted the piece, isn't it? Yeah, and yeah. So what did it, when you first saw that email? What was your what was your reaction? What was your first thought when you read it? Well, I basically just thought this looks hoofing, and then and then. And then uh, it was just like, yeah, that's, it didn't really, I don't think it really crossed my mind to say no, because it's also one of the, a bit of a sucker for, you know, mates in that way. If they're like, oh, can you, can you help me with this? I'm just like, yes, you know, cause it, you know, always comes back around, but um, also it just looked awesome. And I think what we were talking about earlier with the, you know, neither of us had seen action. So in a way, probably because we haven't seen action, maybe we're a bit more fired up to go and try and find our own. But I mean, we, you know, not not like we're trying to find our own doom, but just more the fact we we still got the fire in us to kind of go, yeah, let's go and do that. That's, you know, we're still excitable little boys at heart, really. Just sort of, yeah, we wanted to definitely wanted to put ourselves in in risk because that's something that, that didn't fully miss out on that in the core, but it was something that was still left on the table for me. But uh, I'll, I'll step back. We, I don't think, we, as you say, we weren't finding doom. We were trying to go in and and uh, just speak with the native people and and see what their problems were and there's an environmental aspect as well and we wanted to go down respectfully uh meet people learn their customs and not insult anyone as we go that was the the way that we would make our way down uh, very peacefully and also raise money for charity and and uh connect these two dots and just look at the the wonderful nature and everything else that's out there it's the most biodiverse place on the planet you know and it's disappearing slowly so there's a huge part of going out to see it before it's you know going to be gone, gone. quite soon yeah it's the it's the draw of the unknown if you if you're joining why do we all join the marines why do we all join the core it's the, the call of adventure it's yeah. going to that's it, unknown that's unexplored thing. places and and testing yourself there's a great clip of there's a guy named bill briggs who was the first person to climb and ski down uh one of the mountain peaks in north america i can't remember the the name of it now and everyone told him it was impossible and, and unskiable. And he he was doing it on a surgically fused hip and, and halfway up he had three guys, his his friends, help break trail for him because it's exhausting. And he, he wanted them to break trail to help get to the top. And they got to a point and it was crossing quite a an open avalanche prone face and it was too much for them. They just said, we, we can't do, we're not going any further, sorry. And Bill Britt, he's such a understated guy and he said, Okay, well, I guess I'm just doing it on my own. And he did it, and he was, and he skied down. And there's these great pictures from a helicopter looking at his ski tracks. But one of the last things he said is, "says Without risk, there is no adventure." And it's mm-hmm. true. Without, it's not adventure if there isn't a risk of it failing, of something something going wrong. And yeah. that that either inspires you or it puts people off. And I think coming from that background in the core, that's what draws you. And and I think also like listening to you both speak, and when you just described getting that email. We don't, I don't think we really 
take on board how big the challenge is. We're like, oh, that sounds great. Let's just go and crack it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Really. So how did that take? So you decided that this was it. How long did the planning and build up and organizing? So I'm always interested. You know, I, I served with Nims who did the 14 peaks and he always talks about the hardest part wasn't actually the climbing. It was getting the funds, the organization, yeah, the admin. Same. Yeah. How did that, so how did that, how did it all come together and how long did that take before you could actually set off? So it took two and a half years, I guess. Um, initially I wanted to do 2022. Um, wasn't going to happen. Um, no, unfortunately not. <laughs> we needed, we needed that extra year. And uh, being a sort of, un, I was a Lance Jack when I left. So uh, Lance Corp was like the first, first rank up basically. It's still at the bottom of the pile. So untested, untried leader, hundred uh, percent. I hadn't, you know, I hadn't been tested as, as a leader and you have to convince people that you're capable and being a Marine anyway is like quite a good platform to stand on, but it's nowhere near NIMS's platform as SBS, but even at his platform, if you're untested in the expedition world or anything like that, it takes so much time to persuade people that you're capable. And again, really fortunate because of my dad being a great climber back in the day. He climbed with a, p- a person called Graham Tyso, who set up Tyso's Outdoors, which is a, a big outdoor clothing and uh, outfitting um, company up in Scotland. And I had that connection to Chris Tyso. And the first major step was going in, having a having a chat with him, explaining the, the expedition goals. Um, and he, he, he basically said yes, and he put the weight of, of Tysos behind us, and, and they managed to get in touch with companies like Berghaus, Mountain Boot Company, who, who got us Scarpa Boots, uh, some Sea to Summit equipment for camping. Uh, Garmin came on board through Tyso. We had the equipment sorted and the best possible equipment we could imagine. And, and this expedition's going from 6,000 metres minus 25 to the to the Amazon basins below sea level plus plus 30 and above. So the equipment needed to be versatile. We also needed two two lots of equipment or stuff that could that could handle both uh, both environments. So having that was huge. Um, that took about probably 30, 40 grand's worth of the expenses away from us, um, which was huge. And then we had to concentrate on on fundraising to get ourselves out there, uh, living expenses. Um, lots of other stuff we wanted to to get the right charities on board um practice expeditions getting the team together three or four times before we went out um and we were looking at we were looking at potential of tv and stuff um we thought it was a, a great story and we we dipped our toes in with with uh, media companies and that didn't work out um but we're, it was all looking for ways to to be funded to do it because neither of us are, are sort of Millionaires, we couldn't afford it basically. Yes. And what? So just to finish, we held two fundraisers, which um, our friends and families came together in a massive way. Um, it was basically au- auctions, one held in Edinburgh, one in Exeter, and the friends and families donated things, and then other friends and families would would uh, bid for them, and that made a massive amount of money and made it made it possible. So. Yeah, it's extremely difficult to get sponsorship, get people behind you. They can say it's a great idea, and it looks really good on on paper. You say we're you know ex boot next we we're capable of doing this, but it's almost impossible to do without the support. With the the amount of time you need to be there to fund ourselves would have been we would have been able to do it. We you know we probably I mean, there's a bloke who swam the Amazon so we probably would have been fine in like rubber rings, but it wouldn't have been worth worth the risk. I don't think. Yeah. But until you've done an expedition, people won't look really look at you. So then it's it's us like a couple of ex boot next who haven't really done much or made a name for ourselves so then you've got someone like nims who let's face it even in the sf world is kind of superhuman lungs and running up and down the biggest mountains on earth and he can't get decent sponsorship so it's like with, with taizo we were so fortunate and yeah he, he's chris taizo has been awesome from the stars isn't he yeah so we're yeah really lucky with that that gave us a real boost in the right direction didn't it yeah we've got everything to always to taizo like that that made it possible I think people misunderstand. You're right, because Nims he didn't get support. He he had to climb. You know, the, he he had to remortgage his house, and he it was almost self funded the first few mountains that he climbed, and it was only after 
think even five or six that he he actually started to get a bit of traction and people saw that he was serious. So he put everything on the line and risked a huge amount with this idea that it wasn't going to work. And I think people, whenever people look at things, so they'll look at your expedition and they'll look at the exciting part, you know, what happened uh, with the attack and the actual on the river. And the same with Nims, they'll look at him being on the mountain. And the same in the military, you, you look at the actual ops. You don't look at the weeks or months of build up, the boring mm. stuff, the hanging around, the like, it's just mundane essentially. Yeah. And two and a half years for you, you two and a half years putting this together, raising the money to then go and do it. T to me, people miss the point of you have to, you, you can't just do this for the excitement. It's got to mean something deeper to you. Like when you, you're in that dark place and your dad brought this to you and something inside you said, yes, this, this, this means something. And it created that passion. And unless you have a, a true passion for what you want to do, you just won't stick to it. You won't go through two and a half years of trying to make it possible to then go and do it. And it comes back to what you were talking about, having that deeper conversation with ourselves. When you can tap into something, and it can be anything, it doesn't have to, you don't have to go to the Amazon, you don't have to climb the Himalayas or join special forces. But if you can find things that speak to that passion, like your true passion and, and what you value, Life just becomes easier, even though it's challenging. Like you would have, you just talked about how hard it was, but because you had something drawing you forward that meant something to you so deeply, you, you find that satisfaction mm. all along the way. Mm. Um, and amazing that you find Chris Tyso and that he supported you. So you had, so you, the team, you put, so you had the funding, you had to put it together. Who were the other team that you brought on board? And then when did you, we'll kick into when it started and, and how it looked and we'll, we'll start the journey. Yeah, so the other name that was straight on the team sheet was my brother. He's a rope access technician, climbing experience, and we were going up a mountain. He loves, he loves mountains, so <laughs> like me, so he was, he was straight in and he could commit a month. Um, he's the hardest worker I know, like his stress levels are always high because he's just constantly working. Um, so for him to take that four weeks was a big commitment. Uh, and he, yeah, he did that. Um, then we had Liam, a good, good uh, childhood friend of Ian's, who's a doctor. Uh, again, it was great having him uh, right from the start. He was committed and, um, you know, basically signed the dotted line and there was no question there. He, he was coming along as well for, for stage one. Um, so that was our group for stage one, which was the mountain and then um, finding the source and then a walk down, basically hiking down the small rivers before they were big enough to put a boat in. So lots of abseiling down waterfalls and really good fun highlands sort of uh, just, just having a laugh basically, weren't we? Cutting, mm. cutting about, enjoying the scenery um, and following the flow of water. Uh, and then stage two, Ben, my brother, stayed around for a bit of that and that's when the rivers were big and we, we got into um, some whitewater rafts and uh, we had a really great couple of days in this really gnarly part of the, the river. Uh, according to our guide at that point, we were the, the first team in 10 years to attempt this this canyon in the Pastaza. Um, and it was just great fun. Um, I think you could probably tell the story about the, the rainy night. Let's uh, let's go back first. So before yeah. we get to there, let's yeah. let's go back to stage one and, and the mount. So how does that actually, you fly in, trek it, like how, because I've got no idea, like how does that, and you said you had to actually find the source. So that's not even a known, so you didn't even know. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm skipping ahead way too much because the mountains are great, a great part of the, the expedition. They flew into Quito on the 28th of April and we spent about two weeks um, in a hire car just wrecking our route, finding um, you know, our route down the river and doing a few other mountains. We did Tungarawa and uh, Pico Ridge. I can't remember the name of the other one, but you know, working up in altitude and getting our getting ourselves ready for for Chimborazo, which is six, just over six thousand meters, so it's not huge, um, but it's you know for for lads that live down it's at sea level, it's it's a shock to the system for sure. Half like oh, was, yeah, I was hanging out. Yeah, <laughs> so was I. Like Jan and I couldn't sleep in in Quito the first two yeah. nights. Like you just the just the thin air, like it's keeping keeping us up. So, um, and. 
yeah, I suppose we uh, we spent two weeks doing that, and then we we attempted Chimborazo, and on the first attempt, we were weathered off. Um, we'd spent a lot of money on on mountain guides, pr- pr- pretty much just over half our budget had been spent on mountain guides, um, and we had two more days with with them. Otherwise, we're going to have to buy more basically, and and we couldn't really afford to do that. So the the second attempt was do or die really, and really luckily. Um, well, first, tragically, Ian yeah, I couldn't had, make it. Yeah, yeah, he'd got bad altitude sickness on on Tungarawa and you know, swelled probably a lung full of dust and yeah. combined with. Yeah, but I've always had some sort of well, we're going to call it a lung infection, but there was something going on, and I just on the first attempt up the north face, I was just hanging out much more. Like we had, we had like horses with us for the first day, and that was just that was quite an easy. Um, well, I don't know how, how far. Yeah, yeah, just a quite an easy ascent. But I was, I was really, I was in struggle town. We hadn't even gotten to the glacier, so I was, um, yeah, hanging out and going through all these like little demons in my head, saying, "You're weak. You can't do it." And I was like, "Oh no!" And then I was just listening to them, going, "Yeah, please." Um, and then we, the weather window opened up for the second attempt, um, and I remember, yeah, Johnny saying, "Right, we can go." I think it was in two days' time. We can, we can, we can do it. And I just said, "Mate, I, I'm not going to lie. I won't be able to do that." And I'm glad I did because if I had gone up, they would have had to turn back and probably Kazakh back me off the mountain. My lungs just weren't were not having it at all, and just constantly like having these horrible phlegmy coughs. But it wasn't that's, nice. But it's also when decision was made, it was like, okay, that's that has to that has to happen. When Ian was talking earlier about having a word with himself, that's what I was thinking about because you were comfortable enough. To say no, and to that was a team decision to let the team make it. If he'd pushed himself, we'd have all had to turn around, and that um, that was a harder decision, like you were saying about having a word with yourself and maybe choosing a different path. That was the, the same thing there, and what was even more not surprising to me, but just that I noticed is he and I were going the whole way together, and if you in if you in your own head you don't do the first thing that you wanted to do, maybe you start rapping down the line but it made you stronger like he was even more invested and I, I knew that was the case anyway because I know I know him but it was just something to note like that's how comfortable you were with, with yeah we with had it. a good we, good day we found what we thought thought was the source so we went up to the actual snow line about 5,000 meters and we were like yeah this is it and we had a really good day doing that didn't we and, and found and we and it actually started to to sort of rain sleet snow and we could actually see the water Coming off, and we we're like, "This is this is that." We found fantastic. the highest source. Yeah. That you know, must have been, yeah, awesome stand, that moment standing at the highest source of the Amazon must have been. Yeah. It's just such a surreal. You get those moments in life that's just it's so surreal that you're actually, especially two and a half years of planning, and then you're stood at the highest point of the largest river on earth. Yeah, so few people will have stood at. That's and amazing. Just as we get there, the heavens open, and it just shows us like. The drips start coming down, and you, the first little trickle of muddy water just was created in front of us, and then we just li- literally like children followed it all the way down to to the Rio Chimborazo, which is the first named the river. river. The wildflowers and <laughs> yeah. holding hands, going, yeah, yeah, yeah. "We found it." <laughs> right, that's I think it's unbelievable. And that point you were talking about that unself because unselfishness is one of the commando values. And again, if it's so important and it's drilled into you from day one of, of commando training that you're there to support each other. And obviously the training team is a huge thing that, and it's why you get thrashed and it's why you're up till 3am polishing boot pipes with black polish, which seems pointless, but the point is you're all working together. And when you're all tired, the guys that don't dig in and help out, they're not the people that you want Mm -hmm. to the end. You need those people are going to work for each other. And so being able to remove that ego and say, I need to step step back, of, which is a huge thing. You've just got there. You spent two and a half, invested two and a half years towards this vision. And then the very first thing that you're going to do to be able to, again, have that conversation with yourself, remove that ego and be willing to step back. So overall, the mission continues and the team to go forwards is like, which is obviously why you chose Ian to come because mm-hmm. you, you need... If you don't have that, it's just going to fall apart. And again, it comes back to the ego piece. So good egg. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's 
risk management when I was there. Yeah. When they were setting off, I was just like, ah, tabs out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just chill out here. Yeah. Yeah. To be honest, yeah. man, yeah. the three of us didn't really enjoy that. <laughs> so they were, yeah. <laughs> We enjoyed yeah. about five minutes on the top, like appreciating the sunset, and then you're just straight back into, oh god, this is steep going down. <laughs> the footage you got was amazing. Yeah, you know, it, it is. Was, it was what it was. Worth it. Do you know what you laugh? It, my, I was on. I did a, a deployment on first thing I did and joined the Marines, and we did this tourist deployment. We we basically sailed out on ship to uh, stopping at oh, where did we go? Like, um, Gibraltar, Greece, uh, Turkey, and it ended up in Malaysia. We did jungle training. But we had within the troop, they used to do commando of the week and chosp of the week. So mm. it'd be anonymous, but names in a hat. And it's whoever did well got commando of the week and whoever fucked up basically got chosp of the week. And they had punishments like, if you got chosp of the week, you had to wear these white leather loafer shoes and this raccoon hat. Or <laughs> you had to, everywhere you went, you had to pretend you were driving in an, an invisible motorbike. So you had to go around the ship and you just go, like, bum, 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 <laughs> Like to start it and everything, yeah. so you look like an idiot to every, so like those everyone were the else. Profs for commanders, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. And I remember, yeah, you, know, you talk about, you know, joke about they're off doing hard stuff and you're just relaxing back. I got, we were in Bangladesh and I got horrendous DMV, like just stomach bug. And so I didn't go ashore for it was like an exercise for a few days or a week or something, and you you feel shit. Whenever when everyone else is doing something, you, you do you do feel left out and you do feel shit. Not mm. and it wasn't even it wasn't like a big exercise or anything. But you, you feel like you're letting people down and you should be there. And then that week, as a result, to cop it off, I got chossed by the week because it was like <laughs> Jeffers for not. It's all in the hats like yeah. Jeffers because he wrapped on the exercise. Jeffers weak for getting DMV for yeah. not getting short. <laughs> yeah. So it kind of like all compounds compounds and you do. But it is those times that also mold you as well because mm. you have to have those demons in your head where you are that negative self-talk like this is mm. this is shit basically um yeah. but like you said like they'll have gone ashore and created an extra bond there and if you're sitting back in a situation where you've missed out on that you're killing yourself as well because you're missing out on that and the stories that extra bond. Yeah, they all come back yeah, and yeah. The, for that week afterwards they're all telling stories about this and that and stuff and you're not you're not part of it you yeah. you feel on the outside until you do the next, you know, a week later and you've done the next thing and then, and then you're, you're back, back in. Yeah. But yes, you feel like when you went into the troop, you feel on the outside. And it's a horrible feeling when yeah. you feel on the outside of something. You're not nothing better of completing some challenge or whatever you've done. And that that like combined feeling of um, it's like an addictive sort of I've, a hardship, almost completing a hardship together with your, with your brothers around you. There's, you know, when I saw them come off the mountain... I was trying to be like nursemaid, basically, and sort them out, and then drive them into the, the local local town, Rio Bamba, wasn't it? Yeah. Rio Bamba, yeah. Um, but seeing them come off the mountain, they they were, you know, proud but bedraggled, and um, but I was like, ah, oh, I just felt threadbare that I couldn't also be you hanging out with them and yeah, clink beers at the end of it, you know. But it's really, yeah. really that's the. And whenever I speak to you, ask anyone who's left the military, what do you? Everyone always asks, what do you miss? And I've not met a single person where the first answer isn't well, the people around your lads, the bloke, the people around mm. you, the people you serve with, because you can't, the closest I've got to it is playing. We had a great rugby coach growing up and a great team and it was a really close bond and that hardship going through the games, you know, in your teenage years and playing hard, doing something hard basically together as a team and fighting for each other. But the, the military, you do it in such environments in such a way and through such hardship that it's impossible to recreate on the outside. You just can't. And we always talk about it here, that it's such a special experience. And like you said, it there's there's no other feeling like it to go through something shared with other people and that unique bond you create is just an amazing feeling. It's it just is. so good. So you, so you <clears throat> found the source went through the mountain stage and then you finished that. And then I guess that's then stage two, actually heading down to the proper, the river proper. Just about, yeah, we said goodbye to Liam, the doctor, um, and Ben, Ian and I finished stage one, walked to a place called Ban Banos, or Banos. Um, and that's where stage two began. And from there we were in the, in the uh, let you spin one of the rapids actually, that was. Yeah, well, there's a couple of moments that made us, Made us laugh a lot. The um, 
there's a canyon there on the on the rapids which hadn't been done in 10 years and the last person who had done it was our our guide our um rafting guide called pat he's a lovely bloke and uh as we were about to go through it we we were pretty comfortable on the water and so is ben uh, johnny's older brother we were more than happy being in the raft but you looked back at pat and you could see the whites of his eyes when he was looking at the canyon <laughs> and we we just started like, and like we were like ah oh, this is us Do you know the we gates thought? the gates are afraid <laughs> yeah it's like well, we're gonna have to rely on our swimming skills here quite yeah. a lot because uh because he was and then the other the other raft as well there's blokes in there that were absolutely bricking it before going into this canyon because it hadn't been done in so long and i think it's it's quite it's such a changeable river so what can be a grade five kind of passable is then just a death trap so he was kind of after after a few rapids he was fine but it was funny with the moment we kind of like looked at each other looked back at pat and he was just yeah just made an absolute stain of his pants as before he went in there and then we yeah we just started um we just started laughing and going all right well this this is it then <laughs> just made it into stage two and we'll we'll probably be brown browners after this <laughs> one on the geography of of like south american rivers are crazy like nothing like british rivers we'd be going going down one meander and he's pointing at the other side of the valley a kilometer away and he's like last time i did this the river was over there it it changes massively it takes whole villages away with it sometimes um and it can raise it can rise three meters and five up to five meters in, in the night so when you're looking for a camping spot you know <laughs> you're you're looking high and there's so many things that when we were doing one of the pre-expedition hikes um the the mountain uh el altar it's called was closed because the flash floods just washed some tourist off the side of the hill you're literally walking along drier land and within seconds you're in a, a torrent that's coming down the river because rainfall has happened in another valley over and it's been so heavy and the ground is so porous and loose that it, it just mudslides all the time everywhere you look there's scars on the side of the hill from mudslides so that whole geography thing was like figuring it out for us was quite um interesting mm -hmm. and then on onto the river it was good to have that guide pat and then seeing him being a bit a bit uh, afraid was like right so this is pretty gnarly then but you, you still know. that but you still did it. i mm -hmm. love that description you're looking at it the guide's afraid no one's done this canyon for 10 years you know like, well this is but that yeah. ability I do, I do, it's so funny and it, i don't know how you deconstruct this there's a huge chance you, you know we again commando value chill for the, for cheerfulness in the face of adversity adversity but that acceptance of this could be really bad something could go really wrong here but you're just like well we're cracking on we've come here yeah. to do it so what we'll just we'll give it a go and we'll see what happens but it's that belief you don't if you didn't have a belief in yourself that whatever happens in that moment you'll find a way and you'll deal with it then you wouldn't do it so that mm -hmm. ability to bring the humor to it to bring you take you out of that highly stressful because if you went into that and you're tense and you're like oh god really bad things are going to happen that spreads across you know you talk about leadership that spreads to everyone else and i guarantee if you would have been like that and pat was worried there's a chance that you that team you as you as an expedition wouldn't have gone through but because you're like well let's just kind of laughing like let's do it yeah. then that spreads to everyone else yeah yeah, it definitely spread within our boat. The, the fear in the Ben too is a bit. Well, he just uh, couldn't, couldn't vanish. There's <laughs> another lad who's he's quite a good paddler, but he was on the other other raft, and he was he had the, in, the infectious fear in him. And yeah. I was like, he needs to stay away from our boat because I don't want that because <laughs> it does leak into you yeah. when someone is so afraid that you know he's. It always reminds me of that that scene in the Gladiator where that just before they go out into the actual ring and that guy just pees himself yeah. and then just gets smashed in the head. <laughs> that's the kind of <laughs> but you're there like that oh i don't want to be near that kind of you yeah. know we'll we'll kind of be nervous but have a laugh and then you you settle back into that kind of rely on your abilities we know we're strong swimmers and we we know we can paddle like we i can float easily in most things i just sort of you know get my love handles to keep <laughs> me up and uh but then you're also looking i'm looking at john and um, ben thinking i've got two awesome blokes with me who would definitely sort me out and then pat the uh the raft guide is yeah he was really sound really knowledgeable so that goes into that it's like not the no cuff too tough because that's kind of a lazy way of saying i can't be asked to plan but you do it is that kind of risk management you, you wouldn't do something if you knew you were going to 
you know, die. Yeah. But, you, but you do just go, actually, yes, this is dangerous, but we're capable. We've got this. Yeah, we, we can do this as long as we switch on. And then... And that I'm session, like the, the expedition rules are, we must stay <laughs> as close to the river as we can. And if we can, at least within that valley, you can't cross over a peak and get into another river valley. If you do, you have to come back to that point to continue. We're following the flow of water. And this was the only point in our entire trip, as far as I could see, where the road deviated far too far away from the side of the river. So we had to follow that part by boat. There was no option but to go down it. And it didn't look like we were going to die. Um, it just looked like we might get into a bit of trouble. Um, so that was it. There was no choice. We were going to go for it and smile about it. And actually, it was a brilliant part of the expedition. Yeah, it was. And that's the key, because it's infectious, whether you smile about it or you bring that that negativity and, and the fear. And just having that laughter, it brings you, it just takes it down that notch. You know yeah. it's dangerous. You know you're going into it. And being able to, I think that's the other thing that teaches you, you're taught through training because it's progressive and you progressively do hard things. You learn to control your nerves. You learn when you're going into adversity, when you're going into hard things and you, because we all get nervous and we all get uncomfortable and fear things and that doesn't go away. And there's something that I think people misunderstand. You, you don't get rid of fear or discomfort, but you learn to manage it. Yeah. And so you go into that, you've got years as going through everything you've done in the military. You understand how to control your emotional state of nervousness and fear and still be able to take action and mm -hmm. put yourselves at ease. And that's such a, if learning that skill, and it is a skill, it's just something you, you learn through the military and anyone can pick up. But you have to actively practice it. But when you do, like it's so powerful in life because it doesn't matter whether you're public speaking on stage, do going down rapids in, in a canyon <laughs> unknown in, in the Amazon, or even just having a difficult conversation with someone, whether at work or, you, or your partner, being able to control that emotional state and, and move forward and take action just makes life feel easier, mm -hmm. even when you're doing really tough stuff. So, mm -hmm. yeah. It's your approach, isn't it? You, you can be scared, but you can, you're doing it anyway. So you can either, you know, cack your pants doing it, or you can use that fear to, you know, conjure up some aggression to attack it. And it's just a different way of, of, of doing something. Yeah. It's, it, good, it's happening anyway. So what's the point in crying about it when you can just crack on and actually try and have a laugh? It's not, it's not like you're trying to be some sort of gnarly Viking coming over the North Sea, laughing at the waves. But it, if, if you can, you know, go through a situation laughing rather than screaming, I'll, I'll, choose, I'll choose that, you know. And the only reason, the only way you can manage fear is by having managed it before or having dealt with it before. So you have to put yourself into situations more and more often and then it, and you get better and better at it. Yeah, it's skill development and yeah. people miss that. They want to get, they want to jump from where they are now to being completely mentally tough or resilient, whatever it is, but you have to put yourself, you have you to find ways line, yeah. Yeah, to step towards it. So you did the, is, is it past the, so you did the Gnarly Canyon part, what was next and where did the... Uh, because there's another story which we briefly touched on before this with the with the trees. Where does that come in? So yeah, so that um, that second day ended and it just torrential downpour all night. You know, one of those where you're getting wet from your arse first through your hammock coming up the way because it's bouncing off the ground so hard. Uh, and that was all night, wasn't it? And yeah, when we were staying next to this bridge and got back to the bridge and the water had literally risen probably three to five meters. Uh, and it was just a brown torrent with like full-sized trees flying down. You could hear them smashing off the sides. And, and the, the, our put-in spot was like about 10 meters thick with just timber, you know, all this timber just <laughs> doing this. Um, and yeah, we, we went down and had a look. and We all G'd up from the day before. Yeah, we had no it. sleep, <laughs> pretty much. I'd go out on my hammock to move positions and trot on ants' nests. Luckily, oh, yeah. they weren't like nasty ants. I was still jogging on the spot and just like, you know, doing the whole uh, sort of thing that, you know, completely natural reaction of sort of squealing as ants were biting me. And then, uh, so we were like, oh, that's actually quite a funny night. None of us got any sleep. We were all like really happy from the day before we'd done the canyon and we were still really like G'd up, ready to go. But there were these full, you know, bigger than old English oaks flying down the river. And I, I think we worked out to be near like 20 miles an hour when you're looking at a river going that fast. And it was massive. 
absolutely massive with these lots and lots of trees flying down. And we were still like, yeah, we're going, we'll get on it. And then <laughs> <laughs> I think some, a couple of the, the guys who were a bit nervous the day before, actually they were good because they had kind of talked a bit of sense into us because they were like, well, if we do capsize, that is the end of you. You, 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 cannot, you cannot swim in this, there's no chance. Because if you fall into an eddy, and you've got a tree flying down at 20 miles an hour, there's no chance you're surviving that. Okay. So then we were like, actually, oh yeah, that's good. Let's, let's get the, let's put this pre-workout to bed. And then- <laughs> Whirlpools of trees, like thick trees, <laughs> like in the eddies, like just solid wood floating at the surface. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to batter your way out of it. But we all kind of just thought, oh, but we won't capsize, we'll be fine. We'll, <laughs> as long as we're in the boats, we're fine. And it was just, nah, I trying to- There's that risk, risk management thing. If, if it had gone wrong, it would have been catastrophic. Yeah. So we couldn't, we couldn't quite risk it. Deflated drive back upstream. Um, and then at that point, my brother Ben was leaving and Jake, a uh, good friend of mine from the States, a paddler, was arriving to, to continue with us. Um, so we ended up driving down a dirt track close enough to the river that we were within the, the rules of the expedition down to a place called Copataza, which is an Ashuar community, a uh, native Ashuar tribe. Um, and they welcomed us in really well. Um, they designated a, a big sort of old shack for us, I guess, to hang our hammocks in. Um, and Ben uh, left that that next morning with Ivan. And Ivan is a cool character. He's, I don't know if you've seen Vikings, Floki. Yeah, Floki yeah, the boat yeah, yeah. That's Ivan. Like he, he um, we found him in Quito and he had two sea kayaks that he cut all the way down the middle. Um, and cut the, the noses, the nose and the, both, both noses off and made molds and, and widened and heightened them and made us two Canadian canoes out of these sea kayaks. Awesome, like, um, fiberglass canoes that were going to take us to the mouth of the Amazon from there because Copataza is basically where the water is now flat. So we're able to ditch the ditch the white water boats and, and go in canoes from there. So we had, I think, three three nights in Copataza and Jake, Jake came in with a, a flurry of energy, like, just... <laughs> He basically got off the plane and was into a, a native community, having like complete culture shock for him as we'd sort of warmed ourselves up to it as we were going. Uh, and he was in with the, the chicha, like I was explaining to you earlier. It's, um, it is basically fermented uh, spit that the women will chew up yucca. The women will chew up yucca plant, spit it into a container, and... Uh, It'll ferment over the, over the year, and then they'll serve it at festivals. And we arrived on the Mother's Day festival, uh, and we were just fed chicha until I was violently sick. <laughs> you you so guys managed a, a yeah. while longer, I think. But. Yeah, every woman in the village has their own brand of chicha, <laughs> yeah. and it goes actually the more the stronger ones are much better because it's kind of like a more like a wine, whereas the oh, the, some uh, of the milky, bitty, oh, weaker ones are it's like baby quite, food with a bit of beer. <laughs> And yeah. you're just like, and, and you're trying to be, and it was, oh, thank you in Ashwa, it was Makate, isn't it Makate? Makate was in Quechua. Quechua. What was it? Uh, oh, I don't know, I'm terrible with this, but I can't remember what it was. Um, but yeah, you got these bowls and you, you know, looking up at them going, oh, I'm so grateful that you've given me this bowl that you've been brewing for ages and spitting in, thanks so much. And then you lifting that up to drink from it, going, mmm, Makate, and giving yeah. it back. And, and you're there like trying to, you know, and you, when someone goes, oh, I'll get the rounds and have a shot of tequila. And it's yeah. that sort of face that you pull where you're just like, oh. <laughs> Almost yeah, having but, a stroke while you're trying to drink. <laughs> they're not. <laughs> they're not stupid though. Like they know that we're like, oh, cheers, and like they know that we know that we have to say yeah. So you'd get trains of like twenty women in a row, each with their own these beautiful porcelain handmade bowls that they use, full of full of this liquid, and they'll you know if you don't take enough, they'll wait there with it for you to take another one. And then, yeah, pretty soon. Hey, he's <laughs> just seeing you off. It's just a private joke in the village. Oh, it's, like, yeah, oh, it's yeah, Westerners yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. tell them it's this yeah. tradition. <laughs> I would have believed that if I didn't see the local lads literally guzzling from the same stuff. So they, yeah, they, they do love it. <laughs> like it's part of part it's of It's like tradition. a warm, I guess it's like a warm British ale. You know, some people are just like, oh, that's disgusting. Yeah. We actually, I think it's quite nice. So it's a similar sort of thing. And you, you said as well, the, I asked you earlier before we came on whether you stayed in the villages or whether you were just trying to find camping spots. But it was interesting what you said about the culture. Yeah, so we had imagined it all the way down. The best of our maps were from Google Maps, like, um, and you look at it and you zoom in as best you can, and a lot of the data is not very good, um, pixelated pictures. 
we didn't see as many settlements on the maps as there actually were in real life. Uh, so we'd expected and we'd planned for sleeping in the forest a lot. Um, but you'll end up going past probably sometimes none, but usually one settlement. And the further you progress, two settlements a day. Um, and you have to stop in and tell these people that you're not a threat and you're passing through and ask permission to pass through. And almost always you'd be invited to stay. Really nice people. And they're like, there's nowhere else for you to go down the river. It's getting dark. And we try to explain that we can stay in the trees. We're fine. And they're just, they, their answer to that is that's unnatural. That's not normal. Um, and if you and on the, the occasions that we did do that, we were then searched for and, and hunted down and found and they insist you'd come to a village somewhere. So it's really hard to navigate our way down the river and stay in the forest. And we, we were able to do that sometimes, but not always. And it was interesting what you said that you didn't, you were sort of reticent about using the military, that were ex-military card. But it was interesting, and I'll let you tell it, that when you say that and how you described it, they then, there was more acceptance. Yeah, so I think, as Ian said earlier, like, bootnecks don't want to shout about being bootnecks and we almost avoid it, um, which is a bit annoying when you're trying to plan an expedition because somebody will ask for you, where's your pictures? And you've only got a couple because <laughs> we're adverse to taking pictures of ourselves in the court, it seems. But um, there did have a few, and those those pictures really helped. As soon as you tell somebody the words commando and show a picture of you and calmed up, uh, and say we're experienced and we have all these key Spanish words that we'd learned. Um, we're experienced, we know what we're doing, but we're also not a threat, and we'll show you that we're not a threat. Once you'd managed to get those messages across, they, they did leave you alone a bit more. Um, but what they see is a gringo that hasn't covered in mosquito bites, that has no idea what he's doing, he's in the wrong boat, he's in, there's no Canadian canoes out there. <laughs> this guy's an idiot, I think, and we need to save him and bring him to our village, and then eventually you manage to persuade them that we're fine and we'll carry on. But they also really want uh, to give you a guide because it's their way of, of um, making money, really. Um, and they, they do see generally us as cash cows, Westerners are cash cows, and any way they can to get bit of money out of us they'll try and, and the best way for them to do that is to guide us down the river um unfortunately by the time we'd paid for the boats and the mountain guides and the hire car we were skint we were self-sufficient but completely skint and we couldn't afford guides by that point um so we were just spending a lot of time explaining to these people that we were happy to continue on our own how obviously you mentioned that they were pretty much everyone you were coming across were friendly but i did the only when i and I purposely tried not to read too much because I wanted it to to just come out in this. But I did read something about an abduction or eleven guys from a village. What what's the story there? Yeah, we left a place called Andoas, which is a a fruity town, to say the least. Um, we'd have spent a bit too long like there. Moss Isley. Yeah, yeah, it was just a <laughs> yeah, we were a perplexing place. Um, but we left there and uh, set off, and we were pretty happy and. You know, we're like, oh, great, we're, we're cracking on down river and this is awesome and waving at villagers and going, brilliant. And it got to a point where the villagers stopped waving back and you're like, ah, okay. And you're like, that's not very friendly. Or what have I done there? And you, you're still paddling down. Then a couple of guys come out and basically say, you can't go any further. And this was six kilometres. So we're just over the, just into the, into Peru. Um, um, we're about 6K downstream. Um, we'd set off in high spirits, like, yes, off we go. And we're on our own. We didn't have a guide with us. And guides are like, they're sound, but they're, they're also, they've got their own agendas. So it's nice not to have to play into their into their hands, really. Um, and we're 6K downstream and a couple of a couple of blokes in the pecky peckies with the little engines on the back. Um, uh, pecky peckies type of boat that they have out there, basically like a elongated rowing boat sort of thing. Uh, with a kind of strimmer looking engine off the back. Um, and they had came up to Johnny and Jake and just said, look, you can't, you know, from what we could work out from our terrible Spanish. And that was, that was the second one. First, first one was the, oh, the, the, no, I'm talking about, yeah, the first one. Yeah. As in just that, down from, I'm sure the first one was the 11 lads. Oh, it was, but the, yeah, the, we, the numbers slowly rose up, didn't they? Oh, we, right. Was it two? Okay. It was two, yeah. two guys that stopped Johnny and Jake. And then I was like, oh, paddled back and like, come on, we're leaving sort of thing. And then more and more boats and blokes started right, yeah. appearing. And then we realized that it was 
11 lads. They, a couple of them had machetes. It was not that, I mean, machetes is a bit like having a mobile phone over here, you know, every, every, every bugger and their dog's got a machete. But um, we realized it was all the fighting age males of the village had come down. <laughs> and then we we're like, Ugh. and um, it, it basically, they, they definitely won that got shouting contest. And then we had to go into like, oh, we'll show our bellies sort of mode. And it was a bit where they looked quite angry. They weren't nasty. There wasn't any, they weren't malicious, were they? Or do you know what I mean? I think they, we, they, didn't they feel, angry. we didn't feel at risk of aggression, but they were, they were shouting. At the two words that I remember is indigenous and no, no pass, like no pass. So there was a clear message that we weren't going down river. Um, and they took us, took us, Initially t over to the shore, and I think at that point we were kind of readying ourselves mm. for a potential scrap here. Um, Spider senses went yeah. high because we were like, mm, we just. But then at the same time, you're catching eyes with some of them, and you can tell that this guy's not like a killer. Like he's he's trying to explain to me, and I'm and I'm trying to explain to him. He doesn't want to fight me, and I don't want to fight him. And you can see that in his eyes, and uh, and it kind of de, de escalated, didn't it? And that was an, an older guy, and then. We were persuaded to go back to the village and then we kind of regretted it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and I wish, wish we'd, we'd fought and, and ran What instead. happened in the village? Just took us, they, they took us in and we just sat there. You could get covered in mozzies and the whole village is there. We're, Everyone just looking at us, filming us, you know, because they've got mobile phones and stuff and they're just filming us. And As, as we um, arrived on the bank, every single uh, man, woman and child was standing on the bank with their phones out, the ones that had phones. Uh, like in looking face. very venomous, like not happy with our presence at all. Like I was some of them yeah. smiling and laughing, but some of the, especially the older women, which I was really shocked by, looked very hateful. And that's for me, normally it's the women that calm your nerves a bit and have a bit of compassion. But some of these women were venomous. Yeah. And that was, <laughs> was like, shit, what have we got into here? And yeah, took us into that hall and sat us down. It's like a kangaroo court, three of us on the back long wall and the entire village spread round in a circle. And two sort of elders started having a, basically an argument about what they should do with us. Um, What's going through your head at that point? We were breaking it, I think. We yeah, you just sat, they take kind all of just your stuff. Left. took our passports, they took, and you there, and you just know it's a golden rule when you travel, anyone who's traveled, you always keep your passport on you. And if someone's going to take it to photocopy or whatever, you just make sure your eyes on it. It's just one of those. And they just went, give us your passports. And we we're like, okay. And they're just like, you give us everything in your pockets. You're like, okay. And just like, just like slide it over. And because you just, there's nothing you can do at that point. So then we're just smiling and, you know, that's all yeah. you can. And then they basically, it's being landing crafts and we're fairly kind of um, sort of anal about how we have our boats and, you know, doing using bungee cord and string to kind of, Make it all so you can clip everything in. So if you do capsize, you everything's clipped in and good to go. So we we made our boats just how we like them, and done all the little repairs and stuff we wanted to. And then they'd basically just got a knife, sliced all of that open, got all of our kit, and dumped it in the hall in front of us. And then having a shouting match about what to do with us. So we're just going, uh, you know, there's not really much you can do. Did anyone speak the language, or did it, no, no? So this this is another thing we'd been using Google Translate on our phones to communicate, which you know, if we'd had enough time, unfortunately, we've been growing up in Britain, and that's not a full excuse, but, like, almost nobody here has a second language. I wish I had a second language. I wish it was Spanish. None of us did. And we should have really taken a Spanish speaker with us and then had a Portuguese speaker when we got to Brazil. But the only way we were communicating, we had broken Spanish, and then if we wanted to say something complicated, it was on to Google Translate. And as soon as I got my phone out to communicate with the, the guy that I thought was the leader... Um, that was confiscated. So then it's like, I need that. And he, he only put it on the table next to me and said, don't touch it. And then he'd ask me something else and I'd be like, traduction, which means translate. And then it was confiscated again and then he was getting angrier. And I don't know, when you've got like over a hundred people pointing, videoing and shouting at you and you're only hearing sort of, um, not aggressive words, but like, who are you? What, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Those kind of words. Um, yeah, it's so hard to formulate a reply in your head. And eventually the sort of authority within the village took over and people were quieting down. And and then I was able to stand up and try and portray who we were and get our maps out and show them what we were doing. And 
uh, I did my best. It was pretty poor attempt. Like the, the Spanish was hardly there, but it was enough to kind of show them that what we were about, because they think, and this is just rumors that we'd heard, they, there's a few different reasons that they think gringos would be passing through their land. And the worst one is that we're going to steal their children's organs. And I don't know if that rumor comes from a gen thing that happened once, a genuine thing that happened once, but they genuinely believe that. So we were really trying to explain to them that we weren't going to harvest their children's organs. Like that, that was the sort of level of the argument that we were trying to have to to save our, not to save our skins, but to, to show them that we weren't a threat. So he did very, yeah, John did, he downplays it, but he did extremely well. He was, <laughs> and yeah, basically managed to calm them down. And and then they said, oh, well, we want to see all your kit because not that, more, just, more just yeah. through fascination, not because they needed to see if we've got any refrigerators to keep organs in, yeah. but we're just, you know, we'd, they just want to see it because we were the first, probably, I guess, white people they'd seen for years and in years. A, in Andawas, we were the first, which was just upstream, first for 10 years. Again, yeah. the last one being a, a doctor that had flown in for a couple of months as a, I don't know, some kind of work thing. Um, and yeah, the search, like, it was complete. It was, you know, down to every, opening up your pairs of socks and, like, they wanted to see everything. And that kind of really changed it once we got into that and we were showing the kids things and... You, just, you have that eye contact with people again and yeah. people start smiling and then yeah. it did. They you, get to act, you get to act the fool a little bit when they're saying, oh, what's, what's yeah. this kit for? And then you can't kind of have a bit of a giggle and then you make a couple of them laugh and you're like, oh, thank God. Because all you did was scanning faces. A throwing faces. line demonstration. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me. yeah, this is a throwing line. I think that's what's so interesting. The first thing that you said and just throughout that whole story, you've got a language barrier. But what really got me is when you're first going across the shore, and you've almost, you've gone back to caveman days. You're having that eye contact mm. and you're trying to figure out, like you said, I can see this guy isn't a killer. You don't, you're just reading that off his eyes and you're making the eye contact and trying to figure out in that group, how is this going to play out? Like yeah. you, you're obviously giving off signs and you're trying to read them and the thoughts that are going through your head at a thousand miles an hour of all the possibilities, what you're going to do if this happens. But you always do revert. I guess it does come back to that commando training as well where you get used to when you're doing break contact drills and things and you're quickly calculating, you're analyzing the situation, you're weighing up the odds, you're looking, there's 11 of them. What size are they? What are our odds? There's three of us. What could we do? Like if we need mm -hmm. to at the bank, what's the plan? And you obviously can't really communicate with each other with it all going on, but I guarantee everyone's kind of having that. But then also going in and you sat with those hundred people, how you, how you present yourself, it's all on body language. Mm -hmm, You've got that yeah. broken communication and you're just going back to the, base human instincts of yeah. how can we de-escalate this and win win people over essentially and on that having a a phone to to use google translate it takes that eye contact away so as much as it was helping us communicate some things it was also taking away a bit of that human connection like you know it's like when you're texting somebody and they get the wrong tone having that just having that to look down at and then go back to that person it wasn't good like Obviously, it would have been much better if one of us had fluent Spanish, but it was good having the phone, but it also took away that eye contact as well. So it was it was an impossible sort of situation to come out of as best as possible. But you did. And that, but, you know, you talk about not being a leader and not having that leadership. I mean, yeah, Ian's just kind of said it there. That's, like, who's cool. been through that? You know, you talk, the more that comes out of this, you know, you talk about, it's ironic, again, just to me that you both went through the military and kind of didn't, find what you wanted to and you've had experiences that outweigh a lot of what people in the military i mean 100 people in a place where people haven't been for 10 years and then knowing that these people think genuinely think we are here to do harm to their mm. kids fuck it, who's going to save you what you, got, you don't really know what's going to happen we there's were, no one there we were very, very much on our own there but very quickly on the leadership thing i think i don't think i led in a military leader respect I think the best thing about my leadership was uh, choosing the team because that basically had a bunch of capable people in different roles. And then it was all of us just kind of mucking in together. That's kind of how it was run. There wasn't like you do this, you do that kind of leadership. It was just all of us mucking in together and knowing that, knowing each other's capabilities. I think you set an excellent tone though. I think that's the, you know, Johnny's setting the tone for a certain, because I'm there thinking, uh, Johnny's chatting and I'm looking around going, 
you know, you just got to read the faces and then go, okay, I don't think anyone is. A couple of blokes who really don't like us and one of the women there. I don't know if she was like the chief's wife, but she, oh, she like hated her. us. If she could, she would have taken us outside and, yeah, yeah put us on a spit. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but then you, you go through the kind of, which reminds me of the, not that I've gone through any kind of, um, what's the sort of train you do when you get like prisoners? Sort of Seer. Train? Seer. Seer. Survive, like, escape, invasion. Through, yeah. Mate, I'm, I'm telling you right now, what you went through is, because Seer is, you know it's make-believe. Like it's kind of hard. You go through the whole interrogation and stress positions or whatever, but you know nothing bad, like you get slapped around a bit, but you know nothing bad's really going to happen. Mm -hmm. you're, you're in the in the Amazon with no one else there, with a host, over a hundred hostile people, with no idea what, the outcome is like there is no it's not like in 36 hours you know the exercise is finishing and you're going to go back to back you know back home for a warm meal yeah this is completely different it's applying yeah. to people's humanity is the, the main thing you know where you if you go to shake someone's hand someone else comes in and they go oh who are these gringos and you go to shake the hand if they don't shake your hand and you're like okay and then little things like we ask for water so it's okay if we drink our water and they go yes and you're like okay beginning to build a small mm. bridge here. Then I asked to go to the toilet and they said, yep. Yeah. And they let me go on my own to go to the bit of the bush that was a toilet. So things were slowly creeping up, but you have to rely on the tiniest little ounces Marshals, of human, yeah. Yeah, human, human kindness yeah. to realize that you're not in complete danger, you know, yeah. which is, it is weird. It's like a reset button. Did you, uh, did you do that? I'm just interested because that's the, that's the main lesson you get taught in. So it's interesting in, you know, special forces escape and evasion it went from it changed so back in the day it was the it was the big four what was taught was name rank number i can't remember what the fourth one is um and, and that's it and you weren't you were meant to say nothing else and there was i don't know if you remember a typhoon plane crashed in the iraq in the gulf war and two pilots um i think it was two it was definitely one got captured i got obviously i think he'd, i don't know if he broke his leg in the crash but got you know, you got fucked up. Mm. And he he was going through and as an interviewer, he's talking about it. And he said, this is, this is ridiculous. And they were asking him why we were in this plane was, they have the plane, they know I'm a pilot in the RAF. And yet I'm just trying to stick to this big four and putting this block up and it's not helping anything. They already have, it's information they already have. I'm not giving anything away. And obviously he's under torture and, and being held, obviously, talked about yes that's my play i can't remember the exact story but he was then sort of ostracized when he came back to the uk he was kind of ostracized for 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 not sticking to the big four which is bonkers you know having to people for people to judge him not being in that position but it essentially led to a change they started to look at this is this is ridiculous this doesn't doesn't work and actually brought psychology into it and so the golden rule then became you try and is to not give away any critical information, but also to humanize yourself, to yeah. build a rapport yeah. with the people. Because if you don't do that, you just create a barrier and it's more likely for, for bad things to happen, things to get worse. So the number one thing, exactly that, is to humanize yourself in any way you can, asking for some food, drink of water, warmth, getting smiles. Mm -hmm. So my question is, did that, had you ever consider thought about anything that you've just described there, or did you just naturally start to do that and realize it in that situation that that's what you should be trying to do or is it only retrospectively you kind of realized i think I, I think i instantly warmed and it's uh, in both situations uh, this happened twice <laughs> by the way um both situations it was the older men that that uh you could see the warmth and the sort of kindness in their eyes and it, i would just instantly concentrate on them and uh in that in those communities those those guys are the elders anyway those guys make the decisions at the end of the day a lot of the younger lads would be shouting and you know fit looking young lads with, with machetes there's no point in trying to explain to them you just direct your your conversation an old guy with a bit of warmth in his eyes and he is probably one of the sort of main men anyway so that's how how we dealt with both situations I think. yeah and then um, once the, eventually the the crowds clear off then you can have a proper chat with this guy and explain everything as fully as you can and you get your phone back so you can do a bit more explaining, et cetera. So that's that's the way I, I thought to do it. Just did, go for the friendliest guy. Ian, did you realize what you described there? Did you consciously, were you, were you thinking that in your head, I need to make myself 
there was a bit there was a bit of that i think you just go into you become ultra polite because you're even though it might sound stupid your water's in front of you of course you can drink your water but if someone's there deciding your fate and you come across like oh simon do you mind if i drink my water and then it's kind of they're like yes i have the power it's it is a power play and then once you kind of realize that and they realize you're no threat and you, you're asking you're being polite then it, it builds a rapport um and then i'd say secondary to what johnny said you look for the old man because they're not as hot-headed but the young blokes they're not sure if they want to play football with you or you know play football with yeah, you string. yes <laughs> exactly <laughs> with your heed <laughs> but, um they're not they're just too too fight and flight they're just all you know just gobbing off and piss and vinegar yeah exactly exactly um but the older guys are sound then the secondary to that i actually found the old women having a bit of a mm. bit of a flirt with them actually <laughs> Yeah. Was he, yeah, right. I don't get it wrong. Only but, a boot no, neck no, would be in the Amazon with a hundred people. Like, right, how can I how can I flirt with the old women in the village? Here and there, just a little squeeze of just the Just a little wink of the eye no, to the chief's wife. No, no, my, my missus knows all about this, so she she's fine. But you just have a bit of a, in that way, you have because you are, we're a couple of feet probably taller than most of the guys there. So some of the, some of the women are just... They're going, oh, me, me prima, you can primo. Make this up. And all of that, they're going, oh, me primo. You know, sort of saying, oh, do you want to be married yeah. to her? And then you're just there like, oh, yeah, go on then. Do you yeah. want to come and sit in our canoe with us? And then they're all giggling. And then the guys are kind of like deflated a bit. And the, the lasses are giggling. The old men think we're all right. And then you're kind of, okay, we're in no more danger now. But it is Get on the lash. It's weird, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. That was literally, you, you, that's the exact steps that we followed. It was, and it was that. It was such an icebreaker once the women were giggling with you. And then we were taken, and this this was the second time it happened. Then we were taken straight to the to be offered more chicha. And then once you have a drink and you show that you can swallow the chicha, then yeah. you're almost in the family by then. And so the, old the end of the story, we bread. got married, yeah. chiefs of the village, <laughs> and we lived yeah. there. Yeah, if we'd been kidnapped for more than a week, that might have happened. <laughs> so, yeah. Luckily, luckily we were out uh, so. the next day in both such situations. So. There was no time for wives and kids. What a story, though. Yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> you know, it's brilliant. <laughs> Classic looking for the sort of bread and salt, you know, the old school kind of yeah. like laws of hospitality. If you if you feed Break us, bread. and then you know, then we're we're accepted, and now you can't kill us. Hopefully. <laughs> so <laughs> you, okay. So you're back on. You've, you've had that. I don't even know how to end that. You had that <laughs> experience. So they put you back on the river. What's the uh, where are we at then? Back on the back on the river, back on the expert. Yeah, there was a lot of complications on stage two, which was the stage that we were probably most excited about. It's the Pastaza leaving Ecuador, going into Peru, uh, and then entering the Marañón, which is a major tributary of the Amazon. And it was just complete wilderness, from what we could tell on on line. Um, but unfortunately, due to that first incident, uh, we were we were refused passage. We were sent back from that village and we had to spend a lot of time back in Andawas and try and figure out a route down and the only way that we were able to do that was to take a barge like a, a big sort of uh, barge that transfers goods from from Andawas down to a place called Uramaguas which is on another river and that was our only option so we had to basically spend the whole of exciting stage two on a, on a rusty old barge um, which broke down uh, halfway down and um, that's a whole story and uh, we could talk about that hey. for, for a long time <laughs> yeah. G- give us the abridged the abridged version of the barge so the <laughs> breaking down there's, the river the river's pretty low lower than it should be the whole of the amazon is actually as low as it's ever been right now which is worrying from an environmental point of view um but the way that these guys go down there's lots of sandbags everywhere they? there's guys at the front with big sticks and they're just depth testing the whole way down and the, and it was so low that and also these guys might not have been the best barge drivers. Uh, but we were just getting stuck on a sandbag, stuck on the next sandbag. And eventually they'd run their engine out and, and the engine blew, basically. Uh, and we kind of found that out with the barge just hurtling straight towards the, the jungle. Uh, and there was a bit of a brace, brace, brace moment as the barge just went straight into the side, side of the forest. And that was us stuck there for, for a night. And that's where the, the cat story, which I touched on, happened. Long story short on that one, a, a cat, a little baby kitten fell into the water there and uh we thought it was gone and one of the guys found it a kilometer downstream the next day <laughs> so that one life gone yeah that's eight one lives of left name. um but from there we got picked up by another barge eventually and uh 
made it made it down to a place called San Lorenzo. Um, we spent a few days there, and when we left San Lorenzo back on the Pastaza, we got kidnapped instantly again. <laughs> in, in our <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> instant. Like, it wasn't within even, the yeah. first day, and it was the exact same scenario. Oh, uh, here we go. Yeah. And, uh, old hands now, though. Yeah, it's like, yeah. yeah. Show us your old women. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's a... But that one was, I don't know if that one was actually a bit harder to deal with. There's only two guys that picked us up out of the water, but when we came in, the aggression from the crowd was a lot more and there was a lot more younger guys pointing fingers and shouting and that's when I sort of told you the example of trying to just find the friendliest pair of eyes and right I'll deal with you type of thing but that I think that scenario initially was actually scarier for us like this is yeah this is a bit worse and we'd also been told of a community called Musha Karusha which was just upstream from this place which we'd pepper potted on the barge so We'd got past that place. Who were deadly? They would definitely kill us. Musha Karusha, you don't want to go past them. They are killers. We were only like two communities down from there. So we didn't know. Mm. They'd probably, you know, they'd definitely have interactions with each other, these these uh, two communities. So that one's a bit a bit more daunting, but it was de-escalated in the same manner and we were able to leave in our canoes from that one. And from then on, it was basically plain sailing down the Marignan and into the Amazon. And is is that what triggered? Because there's something before we, when we were chatting earlier, before we came on this, and we were talking about how your world, when you're on expedition, similar to, I guess, operations in Afghan, your world shrinks. You, you don't have the chronic stresses of, like you were talking about MOT, commutes to work, all the little things that you deal with day to day. Life becomes simplified. People often think that it's, life's really tough on operations and it can be if certain things happen but as a whole it's life simple all you're worrying about is, is my kit ready you with a good blunt you're with your friends essentially and you're doing a job that you love so life shrinks down and it's quite simple and you but you were talking about and it being so serene in nature but then you when you hear that distinctive of the engines and how that I'll, I'll just let you describe it because I thought it was I think it's really pertinent. Well, I'll, you go into that, but I'll quickly <laughs> say that I, I fully agree with you with um, the fact that you know people living in a city answering hundreds of emails a day and stuff. We've evolved over like hundreds of thousands of years, and for the last, apart from the last hundred years, we've been in nature all the time. We've had simple lives where we haven't had hundreds of people coming at us from different directions asking for different things. And for me, that is not, uh, that's bad for my mental health. So like going into a situation where it's probably like living like a situation that all humans have, have lived like up, up, up to the last hundred years, you know, just simple lifestyle, not having to deal with that many people. Having a, your one job for the one day, that is so nice and like cleansing for the spirit. And it's just like, this is, I'm, I'm refreshed from, having so little to do <laughs> like it's not laziness it's just like you you have your job and you, you crack it and it makes you happy a large part in our eyes of the expedition was the simplicity of just being on the water and when you do are just going through those those drills and as you, you sort of touched on earlier when you're just with the lads and all you've got to do is make sure your kit's good to go and you're in a state of mind to just crack on whatever task comes up that that is bliss because you I don't think people understand it, especially guys in the military at the moment do not understand how wonderful that is when you don't have emails pinging off left, right and centre or say like missus going, oh, your MOT's out, you know, last night. And I was just like, oh, come on. Like, what, what is life? All these things. And as Johnny well like, alluded to well earlier, if you've got a hundred different things going on at once and it's stressful. And being on the water was about peace and you've got your canoes, you're just paddling, you're in nature and it is, and it is blissful. Um, and a big part of it was the, we were supporting a charity with RV1, um, a guy called Tom Merriman who started it up. It's about the local community and uh, mental health and supporting anyone who's kind of had troubles. A lot of ex-Marines, it's kind of um, Exmouth area. Um, so we were sort of pitching with them as well. Uh, so a large a large part of what we were doing is, is about trying to recognise the difference between Western life and jungle life, essentially, um, and not having too much on your plate. Um, but we, we did have that for a bit, the peace of being on the river. But then because we got sort of abducted twice, we then started to get a bit scared about engines. So you'd hear 
an engine, and you can hear across the water there from kilometers away. So you hear the putt, 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 putt of an engine going, and then you just realize that your heart rate is beginning to match that beat of the engine. <laughs> and you're like, oh God, you're just worried that they're going to be the next village that are going to drag you in, ripple your kit, kit out, ask you why you're there. And then, it, you know, we'd had, people hadn't been nasty, but it had potential. So we, we wanted to kind of minimize the, the risk of villagers hating us. Um, it was time consuming as well. Like every time you go in and you were losing a day and we had deadlines, like we had, we were meeting the girls in the Kitos at a certain date and we had a distance to make up. So uh, yeah, those engines created anxiety really. And they, they also uh, were annoying because we were, the whole way down, we were trying to collect sound data um, for for Moira, who, who came out and joined us to do a dis her dissertation on in ecology. And we needed 10 minutes of dead silence to listen to listen out for frogs, basically, to, to collect this data uh, through recorders. And it seemed like every time you pulled into the side at a quiet moment and put the recorder on, you just hear that start again and it, ru it would ruin it and you'd have to try and take that data again. So, um, yeah, for, for many reasons, just this the sounds of humanity were, were not good. Not good. Yeah. It's interesting how <clears throat> we're so used to noise in in daily life, but how quickly you're accustomed to that silence and the quietness, and even which, in comparison to a city, just the pop up of an engine is is nothing really. But because you'd become so acclimatized that new environment and settled into it, that that becomes the biggest threat. Yeah, yeah the biggest stress. Yeah, the two legged problem. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> always, always yeah. anticipating as much. So. So you meant so you collecting the data, you're navigating this part of the river, and then the next phase was me. So who who was joining out? Who was coming out to meet meet you? So we had Moira Matheson, who is a granddaughter of one of my dad's climbing buddies. And um, back in the day, she's from Colorado, and she'd moved over to Edinburgh to go to uni and study ecology. And she heard about the expedition, and she had this idea to basically listen out for um, sounds all the way down. So this data hadn't been done before for the full length of the Amazon. And through these sounds, you could identify certain species, which could then, their presence or lack of presence in an area would let you know if the river was in a healthy state or not. So you'd have this uh, footprint of the of the data all the way down and you could get an idea of the river's general health. So she was coming out to do that. And Cara, uh, Ian's girlfriend, um, former Navy, and... Well, yeah, and she, she came out and... Um, basically helped us out and she's a, a tough lass and um yeah it was great to see her obviously we got to Iquitos and it was it's quite a few luxuries there compared to what we were used to and we were knackered I think it was the longest paddling day we I think we've done like 95k that day mm. just to make sure we got in we started on the water at I think about six in the morning and got in at seven at night and we we were knackered so yeah. that was awesome seeing her because she was at the top of the steps looking all lovely and you know, all done up and fresh. You turned up with there. one of the chief's wives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, these are the new wives you have to contend with. Yeah. No, no, I just look like some bog monster just crawling up like Gollum, <laughs> just coughing all over it like this. And she uh, she looked like a, a little angel on the, on, the, on the banks of the river. She had, a, she had a white top on and she instantly just came down and started manhandling all our muddy gear. <laughs> yeah, straight up, good, covered good in muck. But that was how the expedition was to go for her as well. Yeah, so yeah. They joined us for a really good bit on the the Napo. Yeah. We had some immigration problems because there's not an immigration post coming across from the part in Ecuador we were in mm. um, into Peru. So that was a, a whole badger set of problems. Um, but we managed to get back to Ecuador, get you know get signed in, come back. But we, we before that, we'd spent some really good time on the... Um, what, what's the river called? The Taksha. The, the Napo and then the Taksha, yeah. Yeah, going up the Taksha and... They were really good days because it was the four of us and the lasses that came, they just add a, you know, just a nicer kind of ethereal sense to what we're doing in a way. Just They just smell nice, you know, <laughs> and they're not like me, Johnny and Jake, when we'd been paddling down, there's, you know, you talk about d, &D earlier, it's just, you literally sat next to a bloke holding his hand while he's having the worst crap of his life, <laughs> you know, and you just say like, oh God, it's just, you've, you've become too close. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So we went with, with the girls and, and we were up quite a nice safe part of the river and we r actually started to really like the stress kind of leached out of us and we began to really enjoy it and go, oh, you know, this is awesome. And looking at the wildlife and we're swimming out into the river and just generally en just enjoying ourselves a yeah. lot more, weren't we? Re-engaged with the expedition, it 
stages two and three, all those two legged stresses had definitely got us down. Like we, I don't yeah. think we were enjoying it towards the end of. Uh, there was moments that we really enjoyed, but generally we were sort of on a downward uh, spiral, just getting less and less. We were still motivated, but I don't know. We were enjoying it less, and the girls brought a, a new dynamic. And and the area that we went to up on the up in the Napa was beautiful nature, mm. like like you've mentioned. So it was a reset, and then Ian and I were good to go once they left, ready for stage four, which was going to be the biggest and longest um, stage from Iquitos to Manaus in Brazil. So we had to cross into Colombia and Brazil. I think it was going to be about 2,100 kilometer stage. So, And it was just the two of you at that point? Yeah, so the girls left from Iquitos. Um, Ian and I basically had to retrace the distance back to Ecuador to get some stamps, which was a nightmare, but we could do that paying for taxi boats and that was literally the last of the funds really gone <laughs> by that stage. Um, really frustrating, but worthwhile doing. Uh, and actually, um, we met, we became good friends with the British consulate, Joe, in Iquitos, and a guy called Fernando, who's ex-Peruvian uh, Navy. And through them, we met the mayor of Iquitos, told him what we were all about. We met the Peruvian Navy um, and exchanged some, gave them some bootneck coins and flashes and things like that. So we built a really good relationship with these guys. Um, and, and we had permission documents and we were just... And we'd also built our canoes into a catamaran. Um, so we used our time in Akitas really well, despite the, the beer here and there. Um, but we had this great setup where we had the, the catamaran good to go, the support network behind us in Akitas. Um, and we just set off the two of us and, and uh, we were making great, great progress through the, the first, I think, four days mm -hmm. of stage four. Uh, going on that, um, it, Akitas, we'd also sort of, we'd obviously, lesson to learn from part we had paddled we were like well we can't have that happen every day we need to have more security and as the, the I think the communities don't know whether they become less dangerous or not because we only had four more days to kind of find out but the there was talk of piracy and and now I think that area of the jungle um, where Peru Colombia and Brazil join is a massive um, you know cocaine kind of area so we were thinking, well, are they, it's probably going to get more dangerous in a way. We might be less likely because the river's so much bigger there and they're more used to seeing tourists and different boats and traffic. They're less likely to probably drag us in, but then we're going to have the problem of actual crime. Um, so we were quite like adamant we need to make some really good friends in Iquitos. Um, we could prove in Navy you were an awesome bunch of blokes. Um, our mate Fernando, who sorted us out so much because he's you know, he speaks fast in whatever language, and then Joe Plum, the British consulate. So we we had a really good kind of almost footstep and security there. And they they were monitoring us. They had our links to our like Garmin um, devices, the mini mini Ridge Ridge two, yeah. Um, and they yeah they were keeping an eye on us um, as we were going down. So we we needed to have those kind of lessons identified to then push forward. Because if we went down just without any kind of support, even someone keeping an eye on our location. We would have been mugs essentially because it's just we would have been stupid yeah. to do that because um, as it turned out that actually proved very useful having, yeah. uh, having some good friends in high places <clears throat> and actually the that threat was early um what happened to us was early we were expecting that a little bit later and, and certainly into brazil um but you know there's a lot of displaced uh illegal miners and loggers and things that have Lula, the president of Brazil, a great thing that he's doing. He's stopping a lot of the illegal deforestation and, and mining, but it creates a bit of a vacuum. You've got all these guys with, with weapons uh, in the area, but they don't, um, they no longer have that way to make money. So they're kind of on the banks looking for ways. And we were away. <laughs> I don't actually think that the guys that, that uh, ended up attacking us were, that, were those, actually, I think they were local lads. But as we move forward, going back, we're going to have to deal with more of that, a lot more of that. So so I guess that leads us nicely into, so you had, so how many days, so on this leg where it was going, so how many days had you been going? Four days, yeah. We, we left Iquitos late <laughs> July. Um, by the 29th of July, we arrived in a place called Pebas. Um, we stayed in a, 
just on the side of the river in a guy's petrol where he, where he sells pet, basically a petrol station for boats. Um, nice guy let, let us hang our hammocks in his in his uh, shack. And in the morning, about five o'clock, we got up and left. And five, uh, three three hours of paddling in. I think we we were um, going pl- past a place called Nueve Pebas, which means New Pebas. And there was loud music and a lot of drunks on the on the side of the shore, and we're talking what half seven eight o'clock at this point. Peruvian Independence Day had been two days prior, so these guys were probably still just hanging one on. <laughs> Pretty impressive, to be honest, on the on the homemade moonshine. Um, but when we went past, uh, and this is isn't uncommon, but for this time it felt different, especially for for Jan. But one guy just kind of did that. A group of lads on the back looking at us, and one guy just drew his finger over, over his uh, throat, and um, uh, you 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 were on edge, weren't you? That's yeah, I just had a an odd feeling. I just we set off that morning, and I felt anxious, and I, I couldn't put it down to like coffee or anything like because we hadn't you know, had our morning coffee at that point. So I was just just had this feeling in my stomach, um, and I managed to speak to the missus. We I managed to get like a Peruvian sim, so I just had a little chat with her, and, and it was really nice seeing her. But I was also like, mm. something. It felt fatal saying goodbye to her, you know, which is a weird feeling, and just kind of like, okay. And I was like, oh, we're we're fine, and just trying to chill myself out, and just be like, now we're all right. But then as as we were paddling down, it just got worse and worse in terms of the what was happening on the river with the people, you know, the big gun, bunch of lads doing, you know, finger across the throat sort of sign to us and then um and just the general reaction from the, the locals there. They were not that happy to see us. Atmospherics just yeah, changing. You could feel it in the yeah, air. It yeah. was it was actually going into Pebas the night before. Like going into other places you somebody would give you a lift on their boat and take you take you in at the last little bit. But everybody was just like saw us and like didn't want anything mm. to do with us and it felt the whole area oh, just so off, didn't it? Yeah. Mm. And yeah and, and that came to fruition i guess so you, yeah so you just so you're going past that had happened those girls had made that and then just just yeah i guess talk talk us through what happened next yeah um so you yeah, were half half past eight quarter past eight in the morning uh we'd passed the movie pay bus quiet all the traffic had kind of disappeared um we we're just about to put on an audio book is which is how we'd, how we'd go down the river Fed up speaking to each other, I guess. <laughs> Just about to press play and that familiar p- 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 engine started again. Um, and we looked round and it was, you know, just a speck at this point, but right right behind us, big wide river, you know, on our sort of heading. And it came closer and then they stopped. Um, and then they started again and came closer and then they stopped. And by that point, it was kind of clear that they were checking us out and wondering whether to, to close the distance. So we just called them in. We were, they're either going to come or they're not. We're, lads, we're all right. We're 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 not a threat. And you come, and they came alongside uh, on my side. If you can imagine we're in a, a catamaran. Ian was in my position. I was in Ian's position. I was on the left. Uh, came along my side and going on about the eye contact before, like it was definitely different in this guy's eyes. One, he was boozed up, like glazed over. But two, he was just there was no like nice. There was no like connection at all. It was just kind of like he was looking at us, looking at our stuff, and making some kind of decision in his own head. And without, um, you know, we we chatted a bit. He he asked for Ian's phone a few times. Uh, I think he put my sunglasses on. You know, we were trying to have a bit of banter, create some rapport, but there was nothing there. Uh, and then he was trying to usher us down a fork to the left of the river, away from the flow, basically. Um, and eventually we. Were, just got pissed off with them. We're like, mate, we need to go. You're offering us alcohol at half eight in the morning. We've got a long way to go. We've, you know, we've done our due. Like, cheers, see you later. And the boat kind of manoeuvred. Um, we manoeuvred our boat to face away, and then he hung on to the rear of the boat. And at that point, we both kind of just turned in, and then he whipped a, a pistol out. Um, and before he could do anything, before he could get it even up on aim, he, Ian with his paddle in his hand, basically just thrust it into the guy's chest <laughs> and put him off balance, which, you know, stopped him from being able to, one, get it get it on us, and two, he probably didn't expect it. Um, so it gave us a lifeline. The distance was was close, and uh, from there it was just kind of a, a charge. I went 
I went for the for the guy, and Ian. So another good thing that we'd been um, abducted before, because after that had happened, we'd sort of come up with a plan that if we do get a real hostile point on the water, the plan is basically to capsize their boat. We both have confidence in our swimming abilities, and if you know if there's eleven on two, as long as we can capsize a boat swim underwater and get out of the way and get back to our boats, we're pretty much safe. So I think that's basically what, what Jan was going for. So he went for the capsize, I went for the guy, um, and then I basically heard two shots. One hit nothing, the second one felt it in my shoulder, and then the next thing I was in the water. Um, and I'll let you really jump in there. Yeah, we have to do this because we it took a few days to patch up the story because it's just like the biggest spike of adrenaline you could ever think of that you're just completely high on adrenaline just, just automatic reaction so mm. it took a long time for us to, to patch together the, the almost the milliseconds of what had happened um and we we ended up being able to do it so we, we have to just jump between each other because we're like oh is that is that what happened got, you know almost we, we do remember but it's so shocking and fast that it you know it's a few seconds of 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 this sort of attack and then we're out the other side and John's got a couple of holes in him. And we're like, bloody hell, that was quick. But, um, yeah, so I've done sort of thrust to his chest. So and just then, go back, yeah. so start from your point of view then, just before that. In fact, yeah, just talk through your point, because John, you just talked through you. So yeah. just from, like, the initial part and just before it kicks off, like, what you're thinking and where you're at. Yes, we knew... Well, the guy was malicious, like, he had... He had was there just one guy? Two, or was it two, two, two of them. Yeah. But you look in his face. As I say, when we were kind of abducted before in different communities, you, you're searching for, for host, hostile faces and seeing if anyone's nasty or not. And um, this guy had like it's just malicious intent to be a bit lawyery about it. But he, you just see, he was he knew what he was doing. He wanted to essentially rob us and kill us, or kill us and rob us, whatever he wanted to do. Um. And he'd done something actually, which just before we were like, we're leaving now. And he kind of gestured to us to go off down one side of um, a massive island in the river. And that's kind of waterways, you know, probably like three or four times as big as the Thames, but still not the main flow to try and get us away, you know, from prying eyes or whatever. So he kind of gestured to do that. And then he'd grabbed the line on our boat and going back to kind of landing craft sort of things like you don't grab another bloke's line it's like pulling their tail so it pissed me off instantly we were we get to the point where we were just like this this doesn't look good this whole situation we need to get out of here and then yeah that's when he he sort of stood up so we both stood up because he is grabbing the line and gesturing for us to go down a, a sort of part of the river where no no eyes would be so we'd both stood up to kind of gone no nah, no nah, we're leaving now mate and then he um that's when he pulled the pistol out and I just was like because I just did not want that pistol pointed at us so did you even that. think or was that just an instant it wasn't much no not really much thought I think it's again a military thing of you hate being muzzled in the marines and, um, just explain the, what that yeah, is because people won't <laughs> yeah so muzzling is essentially you, your weapon should never be pointing at anyone that it's not supposed to be pointing um, pointing at and that's kind of even if you muzzle someone and if you point your weapon at someone and it's not even got live rounds in it, it's still it's still mega frowned upon because it's it's just uh, it's just not a nice feeling of a weapon pointed at you no matter what. Um, so he had pulled the pistol out and was kind of waving it around, a little, you know, in that couple of seconds. But he hadn't managed to kind of come up on aim. So I think I was just like, I don't want that muzzle pointed at either our centre of mass. So just thrust the paddle at him and then I went under the water and came up on the other side um, to capsize the boat. And at that point, I'd sort of done a flanking manoeuvre and Johnny had gone full Highland Charge straight at him <laughs> and just claim all out and went for him. So, and, uh, did you, so you thrust the paddle and then did you immediately almost jump into the water and swim under? It was like one yeah. motion, so thrust the paddle and then you jumped in? Yes, yeah. So I hit him with the paddle and, and dove in under their boat. Um, and fortunately, Johnny... Took up the took a round for that. But. So Johnny basically thought he's fucking off. It's just me. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'm just, yeah. Like good question earlier. Did you 
do you remember doing that? Because I don't remember having control of what I was doing. The only point I remember having control is when I was under the boat, having felt the first round, like basically just a jolt through my body. And then I, the water probably reset me, like being in the water was like, and then I was under the boat. And that is the moment which, when I had control over my thoughts and I was basically wondering which side of the boat to come up on. And then I felt thrashing about and that was from Ian coming up and and basically trying to capsize the boat and getting into a jussle, a tussle. And then from that point, I lost control of myself again. And I was just like somebody was playing me as a as a game or something and uh, went in, went for the dunk, um, which I don't really remember doing. Ian said he saw me just dunk this guy. Beautiful. And then... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I just want to... Yeah. It was wonderful, though. Because I... <laughs> Basically, I've gone to capsize the boat. Then one of the, I think the lad at the back had fallen off when I'd done that motion. So I basically did like a, an easy muscle up um, onto into the boat, grab the gunman's hand to keep the pistol away from me. And the boat was mega precarious at that point. It was going over. And as it was going over, I, I'd completely lost control. And we were going over, you know, it's, it's capsizing. Then Johnny just came out of the water and just, <laughs> yeah, like this shark. And just, <laughs> just, just came straight on top of this guy's head. No... Just like the expression in his eyes was like, nah, absolutely not. You're not allowed to breathe. And then he just plunged him straight underwater and that was him gone. And I was like, oh, all right. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to say this. Yeah. That, it was a lovely moment. And then there's quite, this is because one of us was above, one of us was below. So then for me, he jumped back in. I have very vivid memories at this point of just having the, my hand on the top of the guy's head. And I think I'm just trying to swim deep. As, as deep as we can go and bearing in mind it's not that deep but we must have been in quite a deep area because I was fully submerged there was no like fingers or things coming out of so we were quite far under um and then a second jolt came through my body again um so he shot you underwater yeah he shot, <laughs> shot me underwater <laughs> so savage uh, and yeah again I wasn't controlling this myself but I had a very clear sort of I need to get this weapon and I just my hand went down his side of his head, down his neck, down his shoulder, down his arm. Very murky water. I can't see anything. Fortunately, it was the right arm. And I, I felt that metal weapon and twisted it out of out of the back of his hand and fired two shots right there. And then on the third, it, it jammed and kicked back and, and surfaced. And we're probably this, the distance you and I are, he surfaced and had this moment, I can still see it now, where his, his eyes were just pure fear. Uh, and then Ian shouted at just from my left, like, come on, let's go, and snapped back into myself again. And then I was like, fucking hell, right, what's, what's, <laughs> we'll go back to the boat and haul ourselves in, basically. And, That's yeah. unbelievable that in that, in that moment underwater, you've just, you've been shot once, you've dunked this guy, you're underwater, you can't see anything. And to be able to have, and then you're shot again. And rather at that point, you know, if, if you got shot twice, I would imagine your instinct, natural instinct is pull away because you don't want to get shot again. And you did the opposite. And you actually reached down, like stayed on the guy. And whether you consciously thought of this or unconsciously, I need to, I can't see, but follow the line of the body down, find the weapon and then start twisting out to be able to do that. It's a yeah. pretty amazing, like that's yeah. unbelievable. Life-saving. That you did that. Yeah. I, you didn't push away and you went towards what probably felt like more danger is, I think yeah. two things are very lucky in that point is one, they were both like relatively harmless injuries. You know, this one went through a nerve, uh, which is my bicep doesn't work anymore at the moment. Hopefully the surgery will fix that. But I was able to completely move, and then this one just went straight through the muscle. I was I was fully capable in your leg. Yeah, yeah. It came, went in just above my knee and came out just below my hip, so it travelled the full length of my thigh without hitting any bone. It, like I was I was oh, fully geez. capable. I was so jacked on adrenaline that there was no pain, um, and I wasn't controlling myself. <laughs> Maybe if I had made a conscious thought at that point, it would have been run, but. I honestly wasn't in control of myself there. I was just doing. It was weird, like very weird. Yeah, I don't. I can't put. I don't know why 
that that happened that way. I'm glad it did. Um, and and in hindsight, we, we've looked at what we did for each other there, and we fought, and we probably came out with the best case scenario, and we fought for each other, and without even really thinking about it, we put them off guard and, and attack from different directions, just completely Syn- out of... Out of the synchronised yeah. attack. Yeah. And we didn't yeah. even realise... I wasn't think I wasn't necessarily at all thinking about was I don't want that pistol pointed at me and that's that's step one you know and then I'm not thinking about oh I wonder if Johnny's okay I'm just thinking like don't want this pistol pointed at me and he's capsized the boat Johnny's gone yeah Roger let's get this done and he's just gone straight at him um so we we had a kind of we'd realized we synchronized well together and inadvertently especially when I was out of control and that guy could have brought pistol up in the water and you know popped me there. That's when Johnny came straight out and 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 dragged him under. So we inadvertently kind of saved each other's lives in in a way. It was kind of a way of, we sort of looked at it and went actually, yeah. although it's rubbish that Johnny got shot, and it I hate it because it's like he got shot, I didn't. So I feel where's my war wound? Yeah, no, not that. <laughs> no, I just I'd love I'd much rather take one each. But then, <laughs> but then yeah, if we take them one each, it could have been anything. So we came out with a overall a sort of good situation so we were kind of like okay obviously yeah when you, it's rubbish thing to happen but it's yeah the details at the end we got away with all of our kit bar a couple of sunglasses that had fallen off and unfortunately ian's garbage watch came off in the struggle <laughs> um but we basically came away with all of our kit and they brought a gun to the to the party they ended up getting shot themselves got their boat capsized and lost oh, their did, engine. Did, so he took, so, so when you were shooting underwater, it shot him in the leg. Yeah. yeah. So one of them hit him in the hip. Um, and thankfully, to be honest, he, he's not died. He's he got surgery and he's in jail right now. The, the pair of them are in jail awaiting sentencing. Um, but I, like, we did well, didn't we? Yeah. We got out of it. Like, yeah. we, when we sort of looked back, we it was kind of a, if we had had cigars, we probably would have. No, we wouldn't. Have, we, were, we were completely. <laughs> to be fair, I it, did. We, we were completely like oh, bloody hell, and so, like Johnny was like, "I've been shot twice," and I didn't hear any gunshots, and he heard he heard five. So it, you know, it's just it's just very weird. Yeah. And he came out, I've been shot twice, and I was like, you know, a few swear words thrown down range, but then I was like, oh, right, let's you know get your kit off and you know do with a sort of triage kind of thing. Mm. But when I look back, they had no engine. One of them was shot boat was capsized they had no paddles and we were like well it's kind of threat neutralized so we were <laughs> it's what happens when you take on <laughs> take on two uh, two commandos yeah we joke about it i've joked about it all the way through that you didn't do the things that you wanted in your military career and then you've come on this trip and and found more adventure danger and adversity than a lot of guys do find in their military and i just so f- Within it's it's a running joke within the Royal Marines of underwater knife fight, underwater <laughs> being taught underwater knife fighting. Yeah. Like it's just a running joke, and you literally have taken that one for further <laughs> underwater pistol fighting for real yeah. in the Amazon. I'll be it's just putting put a course together. Mate, for <laughs> you should have a picture up in Limpston, like <laughs> CTC <laughs> Limpston. So you obviously been through that experience and you come straight off it and then as that adrenaline wears off and reality sets in that you you have taken gunshot runes it's just the two of you you're still in the middle of nowhere in the amazon what's the what's going through your heads what's the what what happened then i think that was probably where ian just recognized he needed to take control like i don't think i was in a in a bad way mentally like i was still on adrenaline and but i was probably like oh for one i was barely able to paddle um and we were both tr- trying to paddle for tree info which is a, a village that we could see about a kilometer downstream the flow was pretty strong we needed to get to the to the edge before we were washed past it because then who knows where we'll get the next help and ian kind of recognized all this and he basically had me strip check the exit wounds right there's no catastrophic bleeds uh, you basically tightened me up with... Uh, did you put bandages on at that point? No. So no. I think we both knew what we needed to do, but it was you have to say it out loud and go through that that thing. of is, We're still in... You know, I have, have a bit of a laugh about it, but we're still in a kind of... Not a blind panic, but your adrenaline is still surging. 
and we were thinking those guys might have just been, um, you know, the, yeah, the frontal assault. You know, they might have been the the, um, well, the term for it, but they might have been dickers essentially for the main the main party. So we we didn't know if there's any more pirates coming downstream, and we were in, or if they'd come from the village that we were trying to paddle to. So the first thing was mm -hmm. Johnny was kind of stripping off to show so I could see the exit wounds um, or just see what the damage was to know whether to do immediate first aid to stop any kind of catastrophic bleeds. Um, but then the next thing was Johnny's, I could see he was still paddling like a beast trying to get us out of there. But it's like, mate, you've got to stop because his, his arm was you beginning to, it was beginning to sort of jam, wasn't it? It wasn't uh, as a fact, yeah, well, not nearly as. No. So then Johnny took on the SOS doing the, the garments to get those messages pinged off and to set off both our SOSs, which was, which was ideal. He was doing that. And then check the, check the, because Johnny had the pistol. So he passed it to me, we did the old mag and chamber check. We had four rounds of a wet pistol that I just jammed, but I thought it was better than, better than nothing. Definitely, yeah. Um, and then once we'd realised kind of, I was then paddling like hell to get into the shore and luckily the village was friendly and the, the, they were awesome in that village. But um, once they had come out to help us and going from the look in the guys who attacked us, their face, the, the main guy, the gunman, the malicious look in his face, so then the kindly look of worry from the two guys, one of them is the, the Apu, the chief, um, the kindly look of worry in their faces, was such a vast contrast that we could uh, we actually could relax a bit because they were like, now we've got you. Um, even though we didn't really speak, we could just tell that they had our back and they took us into the side and that's when they started doing, just mm. bandaging Johnny up basically and trying to get the iodine in his, in his wounds and clean him up a bit. Yeah, and that sort of went, went from there, really. But yeah. yeah, that getting into the bank was one of those moments like, oh, thank God. Like, yeah. and then, but I did that. He, you know, he was like continuing with the work and probably good to have, um, you kind of feel, you know, when you're responsible for someone, you, it gives you that extra lift, I guess. And you're probably going through that. But yeah, I was just getting taken care of. I may, I may as well have been getting my nails done in, like, in, in a hammock. Nah. With, <laughs> but then it was more or less jogged up the bank, you know, with a yeah bullet wound for his leg, and I was just like, all right, he's off. <laughs> just, um, it's a comfy hammock. It's probably the best yeah. hammock uh, I've I've had, like <laughs> lying in that hammock. But to touch on what you said, it is when you're the one almost responsible because Johnny's been um, injured, uh, wounded. Um, the next thing or that whole medical side of it is shock. You got to kind of think about. It was shocking and it happened in seconds. And we we managed to patch it together. But if, if we hadn't talked about it and then someone asked us about a year later, we probably would have completely forgotten it. You know, mm. so I don't mm. think people understand how rapid these things happen. Um, so when we got into the bank, I was thinking, okay, Johnny's in a hammock, but he's sat there not doing anything because I need to go outside to try and ping off messages, get satellite feed, and just make sure he's doing all right, so I have a responsibility, whereas he sat there kind of on his own. And it, it's when you think about it and you can go into a bit like hyperdrive, you can go into shock. So we, we, but we were both quite conscious of that. I was um, sure shock was coming and it never came. But it's, I, I think it's because why, like... Johnny talked about it. We were in the hammock and I was like, okay, this guy needs a lot of cigarettes and lots of sweets. <laughs> keep his, yeah. you know, keep his fingers busy, keep his mind active, you know, he needs the sugar and water and, um, like men in black sort of thing. <laughs> but, but you almost went straight into decompression. What's amazing about that is you started, and it's obviously something, I think the military's, you kind of do naturally in the military when you go through something shit or something hard, the first thing you do is chat about it with the lads. Yeah. And that is, it enables you to start processing it immediately. Because if you yeah. don't do that, then like you said, that's when problems start to develop. But I think what's even more amazing is that you were consciously think you were consciously aware of that at the time and mm -hmm. thinking about that for Johnny and so doing things to talking about it, keeping busy, smoking, whatever it is. Yeah. The core was really good for that towards the end of my career, like making sure all lads knew about being able to talk. Like the core was brilliant for that and it probably did help us be aware of it. Um, I don't think I've got any PTSD from this. One, because it was very lucky that, that nothing major happened. But two, because instantly we were just like, uh, chatting, just chatting about it and there's, that's the thing which he was lying in the hammock 
and I was aware oh, I had things to do. So and I, I did have that like spike in heart rate. So I was thinking, this is a weird situation to be in. Um, and I was like, no, I need to just get on, do the next thing, do the next thing. So I keep myself busy. Um, but then I, got, I went to see Johnny in the hammock and he was like, oof. And just the, what, like the, the bollocks just to go, oh, I feel like a bit of shock might be coming in. And then just to be able to say that and and put that that kind of ego, manhood, masculine crap to one side and just go, you know what, I feel rubbish. And then, yeah, while you're lying there, it then made us go, all oh, right, cool, let's get our phones out and do a little bit of filming sort of thing. And, do and then I'll like, explain yeah. where we're at with the messages and then just distract, yeah. we distracted ourselves. But if Johnny hadn't raised it and just fought it on his own without chatting to me, he could have gone into shock and it could have caused a lot more trouble, like trouble for both of us. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, it's pretty... But the Marines is very, very good for that. So, yeah, I, I think it's just a test. I think it's also a testament to your relationship as well to be able to, which is what we've talked about since the beginning, that trust. And and again, that's the most important when you are with someone, especially when you're doing things like that, having that trust with that other person so that you can be fully honest, mm-hmm. going all the way back. And that just translates back to you sticking your hand up at the very beginning go, I've not got this. I, I need to stay behind to make sure you do it. And then it kind of coming full circle and you do this, be able to do that with each other mm. yeah. is it's why, you know, to me, all the stories you've talked about and all the challenges that you faced all the way through this, what stands out is that ability of the trust between the team, like the two of you and everyone else who, who's been on it with you and the understanding of what people need and be able to show weakness and vulnerability and the strength side and leverage that and how that's bounced back and forth through the through the journey is I think more than anything why you've got such favorable outcomes mm-hmm. through everything that you've been through. We had um we had uh, great supporters like we supported each other in a huge, huge way. But I have to do a big shout out to the Peruvian Navy who came from they were on an exercise like fifty kilometers uh, away so, somewhere doing a joint exercise with the Colombians but once that Garmin message got to the emergency services got to our friends in Iquitos and then it was raised with the Peruvian Navy it was like a brothers in arms scenario they sent everything in the area there was like an armada <laughs> that came for us like hospital yeah. ships pro- patrol boats seals like this it was like slow yeah, motion was, seals like marching down the <laughs> right top gun moment because yeah. uh, we were there like, hanging out under this yeah. kind of you know house on stilts and Johnny was getting munched by sandflowers and mozzies yeah. and and uh, yeah. we were tr- trying to sort of keep the police at bay because we didn't know what the police were like in the local area. So we were like, no, we're going to wait for our Navy friends. And then they were strutting down. It was like four Peruvian SEALs and, and two, two medics. medics they yeah. just came down there, you know, just there. Yeah, yeah. it looks cool. Like, it looks cool. <laughs> it was like a danger zone moment, you know. Yeah. And I was like, oof, that's the lovely. Here. <laughs> yeah. so I could have taken a moment just to get a little picture and just go, chaps, so you just pose. <laughs> no, they were, they were straight on it, super yeah. professional. And, and then uh, looked I was given us. like you know so much care and brought into the infirmary um, and eventually brought back to to Iquitos by them and and uh, yeah huge amount of thanks yeah thanks they, to those guys lovely like, blokes can't stress that enough and, and also back home we had um, when the SOS did go off it mu- it was pretty daunting for our families because they all they see is both our SOSs have gone off and they know we wouldn't press them unless it was. An SOS, you know. So, um, my Mrs. Cara was dealing with that, trying to call, and and uh, Johnny's brother Ben. So Cara and Ben were kind of spearheading that whilst being extremely worried because they didn't know the ins and outs of what happened. So they were talking through Garmin to the guys in Akitos to try and spearhead a kind of recovery of us. So, yeah, that was the that was the worst bit for us. I think when we got yeah. back and we were fine in Akitos. We were in the hospital and you see the messages come through and we were like, Oof. I just said, I was like, darling, I can't speak to you because I need to just deal with the police, the hospital staff, the military. Um, and I'll, I'll FaceTime you later and, and probably break down then and chat to you, you know, cause I don't want to be there in front of the Admiral of, what was the ad- Admiral of the, the base or whatever yeah. came in to see us, you know, in his, in his fizz rig and just was just there like, Oh, you guys are right. You know, we were yeah. like, what? It's an honor to have you yeah. come and speak <laughs> yeah. to us. Um, but I didn't want to be there blubbing over the phone to my missus. Just go, we just got shot. You know? <laughs> it, it was hard. Like, like Ian said, there was we had a WhatsApp group made for the family and friends of the expedition members. So when we got back to the wife, we literally saw 
all of them asking each other, who knows what's happened? Does anyone know? And, and you know, Cara and Ben trying to find out the information and not get overexcited about anything. And um, and then they were getting drip fed a medical emergency. Uh, both both lads are, are out of, you know, we haven't heard from either. And then you could see it progress and it was just horrible to think of how our families were thinking, honestly, almost a live feed of, are they alive or are they dead? And yeah, that was pretty harrowing to read read that. Yeah. Um, and as soon as we were able, we called them and made sure they knew that we were both all right. It is. I think that's something um, people talk about, and funnily enough, a uh, bit of a random side point, but Gemma Atkinson has uh, started a podcast. We I met her earlier in the new year in Scotland. And she's got, she's going to do a military episode and it is centered around the people at home. You know, the, the wives, the family, mums, dads. And I think it is, I'm sure you would have had it, you know, definitely my parents knew I always wanted to join the military, but no one wants their son or daughter to go in and go onto the front line. And the same going off on expeditions, going to the mountains when you're doing stuff. It's hard. Yeah. It's almost the hardest. It's, it's, it's much harder for them yeah. than it is for you because you're doing it and you're doing something that you love and you accept that risk. And I think it's worse for people. They're kind of help. They feel helpless, don't they? Because they have, there's no control. At least you, when you're there, you feel like you've got a say in it, but they have no say in it, I guess. And so, uh, I mean, that <laughs> unbelievable... All of it's been unbelievable. It was probably, I, mean, I don't even know how long we've been talking. This is just absolutely <laughs> flow because it's just an unbelievable story and so interesting. But we'll probably sort of bring it to a close now because that, where are we at? Obviously, that ended for good reason, the, the expedition at that point. So what's your plan? I know you're going to go back and complete it. Where, where are you at with, where are you at with Summit to Sea? What's the plan how can people find out more yeah. about it? Thanks for bringing that up because we always forget to do this bit and it's probably the most important bit is for the, for the listeners uh, or watchers on YouTube, please uh, give us a, a follow and interact with us on socials um, and have a look at the website. We've got a, a blog going up, quite a intricate blog of each stage and try to chat out and, and describe every, every bit. So there's a lot of good information on there. Um, and you know we're looking for funding and, and sponsorship still to to be able to to go back out and complete it. Um, so the more interaction from like-minded people like your viewers, the better for us. Um, I guess in the website will be underneath link links to that. Is that possible for you? For you oh yeah, we can, yeah we'll put the links in the description. But just what is what are the best? What are your handles on social media? What's the so website if you, address? If you go on www summit to see all in words. S U M M I T T O S E A dot org dot UK. Then from there you can look you can get links to all of our socials. Um we're probably most active on Instagram, um, which is summit underscore two underscore C underscore two three. Uh so the more interaction the better. Um and then we'll try and get better content out there. <laughs> so, but um yeah, the plan is basically for, for us to go back in June. Uh we're looking at Ideally, a six-man team. We don't want to go back out with weapons. We want to keep. This is we're, this is still ongoing planning, but we'd like to keep the dynamics of the expedition the same. If you go out with a weapon, you're gonna break as many bridges as you might make yourself safer with others. So, having a bigger footprint is probably the best way. Lots of big, tough-looking uh, team members, not necessarily <laughs> blokes, but probably end up that way. Uh, going down the river as a big footprint and and um, guides. The main the main reason for our fundraising now is so that we can find and pay for guides uh, and they can direct you around troubles. They can de-escalate situations a lot faster than we can with our broken Spanish and, and into Portuguese. So um, we need to go basically down with a bigger footprint is the main. Mm. Yeah, and we, uh, the charity we're sort of um, supporting is Rainforest Concern and they're a the brilliant charity that basically buy up um, huge sort of swathes of rainforest, um, along with kind of permission from the indigenous people. Uh, they actually look after the rainforest so it doesn't get, get logged and used for use for other things. And they give the protection of the rainforest back to the indigenous people to run it, uh, which is really important. So, so we yeah we're we're um, sort of firmly supporting them, and we we have plans to go on from the Amazon to then try the Nile. 
uh, hopefully the Yangtze. Um, so this is the, the first of what we hope will be many expeditions. And each time we go on expedition, we like to try and find a, a, a local charity to try and try and help out the the, the people there. Um, the one we're so Joe Plum, the British consulate in um, the Kitos, he is heads a charity called the Peru Mission, um, and they basically go in and, and build schools and um, look after the youngsters. Um, and which, in a roundabout way, if more more of those kids manage to have decent schools, then we probably wouldn't have got shot at so it's yeah we're, we're supporting them this this time around as well amazing i mean thank you i mean obviously also pick up a wife on the nile pick up a wife honestly thank you uh, thank you both so much for taking the time to come in They're like um, unbelievable story and just yeah amazing to hear it I will be will be following it from TNE and supporting it and obviously shouting out. But good luck with it going forwards. And once you've done the Nile and all the rest of them, we'll do a podcast <laughs> episode after everyone. But yeah, Definitely. thank you. Thanks for coming in, it's been Thanks very much. Thanks so much for having us, Dan, uh, all of you. And it's a pleasure to chat to you guys about it. And uh, thanks for your patience as well with my shit comms <laughs> through the last month. <laughs> <laughs> pleasure. Ways, so. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah, we'll, cheers, we'll call it there. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Awesome. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> the wildest. The wildest death. I've ever heard of <laughs> like, there is no way that you could make that thing better. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? There's no. Oh, yeah. That is mental. Yeah, that is mental. And not one bag off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, that got me in the village. The only way of making that better is if I'd said I've got AIDS doing it. No, don't. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs>